directors. Please remember that this work session of the CA Board of Directors is being live streamed. You can find tonight's agenda and background materials on the CA Board's webpage. Links to these documents can also be found in the description section of our YouTube live stream for those who are watching this meeting there. If you are virtual, please mute your microphones unless speaking. If you're in the room, please make, ensure that your cell phones are silenced. Raise your hand to speak and I'll record the names in the order in which I see them. If you're virtual, please use the chat feature. As we move through the work session, I will introduce each item on the agenda. If, I have, if at any point I have trouble hearing uh, you or you have trouble hearing me or any other board member, please say so. Tonight's timekeeper is Bill Santos. I will now call the roll. Lakey? Here. Dick? Here. Brian? Here. Janet? Here. Kevin? Here. Helen? Somewhere. Here. <laughs> Bill? Here. Andy? Here. Ginny? Here. Sherry? Here. And I am here. Next we have the approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to move? So moved. Is there a second? Second. I've got a, I'd like to add something to the agenda. What, what, what would you like to add to the agenda? I, I, I move to add to it the watershed um, issue to do with long reach watershed restoration plan to have that on the agenda that we've had a lot of input from residents and I think it should be, we should hear it. Second. So do we have time to add this to the agenda? Do we have time to add this to the agenda? We have a pretty full agenda. Well, not you, you don't mean tonight, right? Yes. Yes, he does. Yeah. You mean tonight? Preferably, yeah. There's just so much input from the community on this. How, how, much, how much time would this require? Eric, I, I think we do have... Uh, we do have time? Yeah, okay. How, how, how much time would you, would you request? I, I think 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay. You can Thank come you. Out. I just want to make the point that if we amend the agenda, there's two elements. Um, staff is not prepared to provide any um, information, so I don't know if you want to have a discussion with um, just the board, but I want to be clear, staff can't be prepared to answer specific questions when it wasn't on the agenda. And I also want to remind everyone that means that the public has not been notified that the board will be discussing this item this evening. Um, oh, go ahead. Jay? Well, I think Alan's first, and then I'll go. Okay, Alan. Um, yeah, I'm mindful of all that, and so for me, this is not about making decisions or getting input from the staff. This is more about framing the issue so that we can give the staff some guidance of what we are looking for, should that come to that, and because uh, otherwise, it would have to wait another two weeks, which means waiting another month, which means waiting till the end of summer, because then August happens and we don't have any meetings. And there's time limitations, as I understand it, in this project that, that are time markers that are gonna be coming up that could have things get out of, out of hand that we can't, we would not be able to influence if we don't act sooner. Bill? Just uh, thinking uh, 15 minutes to discuss this issue that has a lot of facets to it. I, I would ask that we further amend this amendment so that it is a narrower scope with respect to this topic so that we could uh, have a, a good 15 minute discussion on something rather than 15 minutes of broad statements. Uh, I think that would be a better use of the board's time. How, how would you propose limiting? And that I don't have an answer to, but I would rather that we narrow the scope than to just keep this broad for 15 minutes. Um, if, if anybody has any suggestions, I would welcome them. Jenny? Yeah, um, I, I share your concern about the need for a hearing. I think some of us have been saying that for a long time. But what I'd like to see is something where we hear uh, both sides, you know, on this issue. And I think that could take an hour, two hours. I'm not sure we don't need an additional meeting actually to do that. Um, so I'm wondering what, you know, what we're going to accomplish in 15 minutes, but I think it has to be done in June, having a more full-blown hearing with speakers coming from state agencies, from CA, uh, from, you know, work together on what would be an educational um, program so the board will hear all sides of this issue. It'd, it'd be something that I'd like to think about. Maybe you amend this 
um, your amendment that would say we have to do that within the next two weeks. Instead of discussing it now, let's just d d make that the discussion for the 15 minutes of what sort of form it should be. Oh, oh the process? The process, okay. yes, yeah, I think that's okay. the I, I, uh, Dick? I'm uh, not for I, that. I okay. think the one thing that uh, okay. we are all concerned about is the uh, uh, Lake Elkhorn watershed. And uh, that's something we could <coughs> focus on tonight, just some general discussion on that. Okay, so if you're saying those 15 minutes, some of it would be spent on process, okay. So, 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 so before we continue discussing the agenda, can I just get a show of hands? Uh, so I'm going to amend the agenda, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, all opposed? One, two, all abstaining? The uh, agenda is so amended for 15 minutes to, to discuss the uh, watershed. That'll be item F under work session topics. Can I get a, uh, is there any opposition to the agenda as amended? No. Okay, the agenda as amended passes. So now, now we'll move on to resident speak out. I'll call on you one by one in the order which you signed up. Individuals have three minutes um, anyone representing an organization has five minutes. Following marks, the board will have a chance to ask questions. Please mute your microphones if you're not speaking. And our uh, first, our first resident is Sharon uh, Boyes, and she represents Protect Our Stream. Sharon, are you there? I am. Hello. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. So tonight, I would like to pick up where we left off at the last board meeting, which is reading from this document from the Maryland Department of the Environment. I hope you can see that. And um, before I start reading a few things, I would like to say that last night, our stream restoration in Longfellow experienced its first blowout. It's a little over a year old. And uh, it was really disappointing to see. And if you come to Hespers Drive, you can see on either side of the stream, um, the street, uh, the blowout that occurred. And that will all be making its way down to Wild Lake and need to be dredged. So uh, I'm gonna pick up um, these comments, starting on page five which discusses water quality. Since the proposed restoration currently flows into ponds, the benefits of the stream restoration to the downstream segments will be reduced. For example, sediment and phosphorus, which is generally associated with sediment reduction to the downstream waterways resulting from the restoration activities is limited since the pond is already capturing sediment and the associated phosphorus. Do you anticipate improved water quality in the lakes will resolve in improvements to water quality of lake release? Do water quality issues exist due to the untreated stormwater entering the stream? The stream mitigation project will result in an improve. You say that the stream mitigation project will result in an improvement to aquatic resource function and passage. The existing ponds significantly limit fish passage, and it is not clear how this project will help with passage since little detail was provided. There are several other in-stream fish blockages. If you're requesting fish passage credit, you should verify there are no other fish blockages that will limit movement. This will require walking the entire length with the intent of documenting all blockages. It's a little shocking that that hasn't been done already. Page three, section two says you will be creating aquatic organism connection from the Little Patuxent River to the project area through the Lake Elkhorn Dam. Is there any work proposed to improve passage through to Jackson Pond or each one? I'd like to point out that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service letter raised very serious concerns about any work being done on the Lake Elkhorn Dam that it would, uh, could compromise the integrity of the dam and that Lake Elkhorn Dam has been classified as a high hazard dam. Moving on to tree loss and wetland impact. MDE is concerned about the potential for extensive upland tree loss and wetland impact. This concern is exasperated by the fact that it is in a suburban residential setting. While we understand that the prospectus is preliminary and impacts to wetlands and upland forests would be reduced through the design, the amount of the proposed impact to these resources is very high. The plan showed many separate access paths through the forest. Is it necessary to have this many? 
Reach One has an area stream repairing area resulting in less area to work and high potential for tree loss of budding backyards. The southern portion of the project is designated as forest interior dwelling species habitat. This site was, des was identified by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as providing habitat for the federally threatened northern long-eared bat. MDE is generally in favor of raising the stream elevation to reduce tree clearing and direct and direct repair and buffer disturbance, assuming it does not result in increased flooding on adjacent properties. However, we need to better understand the indirect impact of increased hydrology on the existing riparian buffer. From site visits, it appears many of the trees in these areas are large beech trees and other non-wetland intolerant species, which tells us also that the beautiful beech forest in Longreach doesn't experience high water very often, or those trees that are roughly 100 years old wouldn't, you know, still be standing there holding that bank together. Please estimate the amount and provide a map of all forested areas that will have increased hydrology. There's a lot of concern about the lack of stormwater management, including pipes discharging large quantities of water directly into the stream, causing the stream instability. How will this be addressed? CA should consider upland stormwater management retrofits that would improve the stream. The 2009 CA watershed plan listed stormwater retrofits as an important solution. Additionally, the prospectus repeatedly discusses how untreated stormwater is the largest issue affecting these streams. For example, Mr. Chairman, have you considered this time has expired. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm welcome uh, to take your questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Hmm. Helen? Yeah. Sharon, you, you, you mentioned a blowout. I'm not familiar with that term. What does a blowout mean in this context? <laughs> What it means is that the stream restoration could not handle the amount of stormwater runoff that entered the stream unmitigated at once. Uh, this is the biggest rainfall that we can remember in our neighborhood since the project was done. And it washed a tremendous amount of sediment and some of the rocks that were used in the restoration, which is called riprap, down um, downstream and it produced these huge sediment islands that are several feet deep. In fact, I sent you guys pictures right before the meeting started tonight and um, it's very unfortunate. Thank also, you. I did find out information about that lot up at the top end of the stream if anybody is interested in that. So I could share that now. Licky. I just wanted to ask Dennis Maddy to comment on that because I know we actually sent uh, our watershed staff out this morning because of the rain event and um, we got a report back on the business. So Jalapoy visited, I've got some pictures also. I would say that this is a discussion and a, uh, you have to see this in the field. This is not something we can talk about because I've got some pictures that are great pictures. There is some sediment that has been transported down. I think you're probably, some of you are probably aware there were several water main breaks in Harper's Choice. Um, they produced a lot of sediment that got washed into the storm water pipes that flow into the restoration area. I'm very happy with the work that's out there, but this is not something we can go back and forth on. This is something that we need to see. This is too big a decision to make going back and forth, or I got this picture, I got that picture. You all need to it see- It certainly is, deal. however, I do. We do have a picture from just several weeks ago, a uh, picture of the algae on that uh, concrete apron that will show you there was absolutely no sealed in sediment on that, on that apron just a few weeks ago. And these are dated pictures. So I appreciate what you're saying. The pictures don't show the severity of the destruction, but my pictures will clearly show there was no sediment a couple weeks ago, and now there is. Thank you. Also, Drew. I'm Drew. sure you know about the trees that all came down, and I'm wondering how much CA spent cleaning that up today. Was that part of our 50000 that has been budgeted to mitigate our stream restoration here in Longfellow, or did that come out of our budget somewhere else? Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Dick. Uh, you said you had information on that lot uh, across from Howard High School. 
Uh, I do. Thank you. Yes, I called the uh, Howard County Stormwater Division about that, and they gave me a lot of information. Um, that is a, a little over of an acre parcel that, interestingly enough, is privately owned. Um, but the State Highway Administration does have an easement, a right-of-way, on either side of Route 108. And there is a street outfall there, and the... Um, the assumption, strong assumption, would be that the SHA has an easement on that street outfall, and they would be the ones who would be responsible for maintaining that and who we would actually talk to about any ideas for something to be done on that easement. And I actually do have a phone number um, and more information about that if we wanted to look into the, doing that. Maybe SHA would potentially even cover that uh, cost. And very quickly, I asked about the um, street outfalls along the stream and the street outfalls that are owned by SHA, they would be responsible for maintaining and um, the other ones are the responsibility of the county. So again, I'm saying I don't think that this is money that CA needs to come up with. I think that we need to use our influence of 110,000 people and the tax base for the county and say, hey, you have to help us do something here. You're blowing out our streams. We know what the problem is. Help us. Thank you. Thank you. Any Thank further you. questions? Thank you. Next, we have Amy Bennett uh, representing Protect Our Stream, Long Reach. Can the same organization get five minutes twice? Is, is this the same I don't think Amy's here tonight. I don't think it matters. I don't think Amy is here tonight. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Richard Bannister. He's muted. I think you're on mute. Your mute's You're working muted. really well, Richard. <laughs> My apologies. My apologies. Can you hear me now? I think yes. Yes. Um, I registered as a as an individual citizen, but um, when I heard from Amy that she was not going to be able to make it tonight, I'd like to uh, be recognized as a as a, a representative from Protect Our Stream Longreach. We're a particular group, and here's my T-shirt. And um, so I'd like the five minutes. Eric, okay. an organization gets represented by a single yeah. person? Yes. Is, is this a different organization from uh, yeah. insurance? Yeah, this is this is Protect Our Stream Long Reach. And that's different from uh, Protect Our Stream? Yeah. Five minutes. In Longfellow. Yeah, five, five, five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Five? Okay. okay, right. Thank you. Um, last week, um, I, I, um, at the board meeting uh, on the 26th, um, the... Um, do I have the right thing in front of me? Darn it. On May 26th, um, I may know, but at the 37 minute mark, um, Ms. Boyd said that um, she did need to make, in response to those remarks, she said, I do need to make a statement that there are some inaccuracies. At least I would disagree with some of the characterization Ms. Bennett has indicated. So I do think it is important to go on the record with that. I would like to know what inaccuracy is in what she said. She was reading from the MDE and what characterizations she disagreed with. And then um, this boy went on to say, we can certainly have the sustainability team present again and provide the same information they provide in February. But I do want to state that there are some characterizations I would not agree with based on what my staff has told me. Now, the staff has told us a lot of different things, and I don't find them particularly trustworthy, and I can go into that. Can I ask while. you, I, I'm sorry, but I am gonna have to interrupt that I, I would really I appreciate if the so chair no would use the civility principle. No problem, I'm always Accusations of Every calling time I want to staff speak, I get untrustworthy is really inappropriate. Can you, Actually, can you say that again, I'm wondering please? if you could speak up because I missed that completely, and if, or if the staff could increase the sound like they've done in the past. So we can, I can hear better, or Rusty, you can hear better. So. I can go. Are we? But can you continue? I, I'm sorry, I was interrupted. Can I begin? Yeah, again? You, your 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 volume's coming a little soft. Can you can you increase your volume sure or just be closer to the microphone? Closer. Can Can you hear me? Is That's that better? better. That's much better. better. Thank you. Much All right. Better. Yeah. Um, Ms. Boyd said that she did need to make a statement. This is about last week at the thing that there were some inaccuracies. 
and um, and she disagreed with some of the characterization Miss Bennett had indicated. So I think it's important, and she said it was important to go on the record with that. Fair enough. But she didn't say what inaccuracies they were, and I'd like to know what they were and what characterizations she disagreed with. And she went on to say, we can certainly have the sustainability team present again and provide the same information they provided in February. But I do want to state that there are some characterizations I would not agree with based on what my staff has told me. And that's fine, based on what my staff has told me. And that's what my problem is here is, and um, for instance, she said all of this is in the sustainability team memo that went out in February. And from that memo, CA said, says in that memo, CA's team of technical experts in this field have reviewed letters and statements that oppose the recent proposal for the Lake Alcorn, Lake Alcorn watershed. We want to ensure the merits of these projects are understood and misinformation circulating around our community is addressed. So in it, they say one, opposition statement, the project involves a 133 acre easement, which would allow for up to 33 acres of tree removal, 50 feet on each side of over three, 33,000 feet of streams. And the um, sustainability routine responses these numbers are incredibly inflated and convey misinformation about the scope of the project. However, page 62 of the prospectus from WSSI says total easement area equals 133 acres. That's what the, the opposition is claiming. And so does WSSI. And then on page 18, it says the proposed mitigation site will consist of approximately 33,000 linear feet of restoration to degraded intermittent and perennial streams. And as an easement of 100 feet, that's 50 feet each side, over 33,000 linear feet actually gives 75 acres on my calculator. That's the easement, that's the limits of, but the limits of the disturbance were calculated by, um, um, I think it was the river keepers, and they made the, they, they made the 63 acre um, estimate based on the delineated disturbance area in the prospectus. Now, I think it'd be really helpful for us to know how many acres are planned to be, how many acres of the trees will be removed. Uh, I mean, one is too many for me. If it's 45, it's for 30, you know, we, it would be nice to know if we actually have a number uh, that has not been provided yet. And then it says CA has no intention of removing up to 63 acres of trees. Now, it's not CA who would be doing it. So it doesn't matter whether CA has no intention. The, 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 the possibility has been handed over to WSSI. So that's an, in, that's an inaccuracy. That is a mischaracterization. And it goes on um, to continue. It says, in fact, there is no currently, in fact, there is currently no conceptual design for the project. In fact, pages 57 to 61 of the prospectus are titled Lake Alcorn Stream Mitigation Site Preliminary concept map, followed by number one through six. It contains where step pools might be installed, where so-called natural channel design might be used, where meanders might go. It's a concept plan. There are plans. This whole, I mean, you know, when Mr. you say Chairman, no plan, Mr. Chairman, time has expired. Th 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 thank you. Do, do we have any questions uh, for Mr. Bannister? Helen? Um, Richard, I wonder if you're aware of the new system we have that if you have questions for staff, there's a form to fill out online. I filled out the form and heard nothing back. I've done that in the past. So, you know, these these are arbitrary. They don't have to be answered tonight. I don't care. Um, I, I actually really appreciated what how you started the meeting, uh, wishing to hear the side that is against this project. And I think that a meeting would be really helpful where, you know, I could actually, I, you know, there's a whole lot more of misrepresentations and misstatements and, you know, trying to frighten us. I mean, that, that CA has basically claimed that um, uh, drain pipes are gas lines that had to be cut. And it's like, this is just nonsense. And they've claimed that houses, that homes are in danger of being uh, damaged by the stream. There were no homes being done in the threat. So it's like, you know, we really need to ha hash this out. And we get five minutes, three minutes, or <laughs> sending questions that don't get answered or have get answered. You know, we're not getting the opportunity to, to, to basically protect what we think is one of the most vital parts of Columbia. Th 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 thank you. Do, do, we have part of this town. Do, do, do we have any further questions? 
Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, on list, you. next on our list, we have Marcy Leonard. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for the opportunity to visit with you this evening. Uh, certainly learned a lot about our stream management from our first two folks. Uh, I also wanted to thank the CA board for uh, the time and dedication that you put into your work on behalf of the Columbia Association. Um, have the privilege of getting to, uh, of knowing some of you for uh, many years and uh, very much appreciate the work that you put in on behalf of our community. Uh, I've been a Columbia resident since 1978 and a homeowner in Columbia since 1994. Um, so I've had an opportunity to uh, pay into the CA assessments for 28 years. I've also been an educator in the Howard County Public School System since 1994. Um, I'm presently the principal at uh, the best high school in Howard County, uh, Wild Lake High. Um, but this evening I'll be uh, speaking as uh, both with that hat on and as a, uh, as a citizen. Um, I wanted to spend some time tonight just expressing appreciation to all, Columbia Association for all that you do to create a wonderful community for our residents and for, as I think about, our Wild Lake uh, students and families um, for our community as well. Um, it, throughout my entire career as an educator in HCPSS, Columbia Association has been an incredibly valued partner in the work that we do uh, on behalf of and with our students and with our family members. I want to say that I've been especially impressed um, by the work of CA in the course of the past year. And um, I've seen that uh, improvement and shift um, with Ms. Boyd's leadership. So um, that has really been the common denominator of the, the visibility, the transparency, and the community engagement in uh, improvements that have really been palpable in, in at least in our community. Um, and uh, Ms. Boyd has really been the face of that engagement and we are um, really grateful to her for that. Um, well, that's been increased presence on social media. And as we think about who our target audience is for the Columbia Association, I'm sure that the young people in our community are um, at the forefront of your, of your minds because they are the folks who will be uh, the ones who will be deciding to live in Columbia for years to come, uh, to have their roots um, be, be put down and stay and contribute to our community. And to find them where they are is such an important uh, decision that you've made over the course of the last year. You've done that through increased engagement through social media, and I hear that from students that they see you and are able to know what opportunities are available. Um, I also uh, just want to commend uh, Ms. Boyd for uh, getting her hands into the community. Um, she, just at Wild Lake alone, she has come out and participated in one of our community nights and also came out and met with um, one of our student leadership groups as a focus group to get feedback on what the young people um, are looking for in their engagement with CA. And as one of our students put after uh, meeting Lakey, she said, Lakey is a vibe. And uh, if you hang around young people uh, enough these days, you know that that is the highest compliment that can be paid to someone who is over the age of 18. So I appreciate the time to join you tonight and to be able to applaud Lakey, to applaud you, and to applaud the CA staff who work tirelessly behind the scenes for your greatly increased presence, for getting the word out about the value that CA and CA uh, amenities offer to those of us who choose to live and work in this community. Mr. And just Chairman. on behalf of the community to express time my deep expired. thanks for the, all that you are doing. Thank, so you, thank you for, your, you for that time. And, and thank you for your testimony and thank you for your service to the school system. Do, do, do we have any questions? I just have one comment. And when you have somebody who comes to residence speak out and speaks positively, it's tough to say time has expired. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but we do have a schedule. <laughs> Thank you. And next on our list is Erica Shavaria. Good evening. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Wonderful. My name is Erica Chavarria, a 12th year veteran teacher at Wild Lake High School and the founder of Columbia Community Care. 
Columbia Community Care has been providing food and services to thousands of Howard County residents and students since the start of the pandemic. And in the last two years, we have served over 100,000 residents at our sites and completed over 13,000 home deliveries of groceries. From our inception, we have fundraised and we have um, been given donations and grants and we have uh, forged amazing partnerships, have over 7,600 Facebook members, hundreds of volunteers and a team of 10 site coordinators. Our vision moving forward is to respond to the holistic, holistic needs of our community through partnering with organizations and community members and providing programming around education, health and healing and purpose pathway, pathways while continuing to provide food and other essential resources. But I'm here really tonight to speak about the interactions that I've been able to have, that I've been fortunate to have with Lakey Boyd and with the Columbia Association this year. I first had the opportunity to meet Lakey this past February. I was immediately impressed with her background, her knowledge and her vision for the future of Columbia Association based on her deep observations and analysis of the needs, the rich history and the unique structure of Columbia. I was particularly impressed with her dedication to racial and social justice, true community outreach and partnering with community organizations who have been here doing the work for many years. I also noticed her particular commitment and dedication to making the CA as accessible to all residents of Columbia as possible, which I believe was the original vision when Columbia Association was founded. And I've been a resident of Columbia since I was eight years old, um, and I am going to be 40 very soon. <laughs> Um, as a high school teacher, I am extremely pleased to see that the young people of Columbia are a priority to Lakey. She has demonstrated this by providing more employment opportunities for Columbia's youth, collaborating with schools to get young people involved in CA. And recently, as my principal, um, Ms. Leonard mentioned, she met with a group of students that I advised from Wild Lake called the Wild Lake Students for Social Justice. And she sat down with them for almost two hours to listen to their concerns and experiences and suggestions for broader opportunities for young people in relation to the Columbia Association. I personally have never seen a president or anyone in leadership of CA um, do this type of engagement with young pe people on such a personal level. Lakey recently also facilitated the collaboration of Columbia Association and my organization, Columbia Community Care, to provide a youth volleyball program for young volleyball players in our county who may lack access to one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions because of the pricing. This program is being held at the Supreme Sports Club on Monday nights, and our young participants are so excited for this opportunity to not only have space in Supreme Sports Club, but to also have a high level of training for a sport that could potentially lead them on a road towards collegiate sports involvement, which is a game, game changer for many of our young people. Most importantly, I believe that Lakey truly understands the obstacles to access and deep inequities that many Columbia residents face despite the vast richness of resources in our community. She has shown that she refuses to allow the Columbia Association to exist as an inaccessible and inequitable resource for Columbia residents. I have already seen various events and programs that are culturally responsive more than I've ever seen before and responsive to the particular needs of marginalized families in Columbia and the greater Howard County area. Mr. Chairman, and I, just is, is I, five minutes. It, it's a five minute, five okay, minutes. we're continuing. I, continue. Sorry to interrupt, Sorry. I just wanted to make sure Sorry. we got that right. Five minutes. I have one final second. Um, go ahead, okay. keep rolling, you're doing good. <laughs> um, but I am confident that Lakey's leadership will make Columbia Association um, the best possible association it can be for the members of this community. Um, and I am excited to see where CA goes in the future. And I'd like to thank again, um, Lakey for the time that she has given to me um, personally, to the young people that I serve and to the residents of Howard County. Thank you. And, and thank you again for your service to the schools. Yeah. Thank you. Do, do, we have, do we have any questions? Just oh. really quick, hi. Um, First of all, I apologize for stepping on your closing statement. That was a good one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just, it was the timing. Uh, but the volleyball program, could, do you, could you characterize the number of students that are taking advantage of that at this time? Do you know just rough order and magnitude, tens, hundreds, what do you know? Not hundreds yet. Um, it, it's, it's in its infancy right now. Sure. Um, and because we are, you know, winding down the end of the school year, it's, um, we haven't seen the highest numbers yet, but we know that um, we just did a, um, a a new fresh batch of advertisement and we expect the numbers to rise way up uh, due to the end of school. Um, and so we're hoping, we've seen about a consistent, about five to 10 girls come through um, and we're hoping to see a larger number, although it is great to see one, it's, it's allowing 
um, young people who don't have an opportunity, particularly for a sport like volleyball, um, who have access to one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with high-level collegiate athletes um, in, in volleyball. Sure, it sounds like a great start. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks. Next we have Philip Dodge. Hey there. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thanks for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Philip Dodge. I was raised in Columbia. I lived in Oakland Mills from the late 80s to the late 90s. My wife and I returned here in 2006 to raise a family, and we've been in King's Contrivance for the last 16 years. We came here or came back obviously for open space and quality of life, but most importantly for the values on which Columbia was founded, especially the values of personal growth and inclusion. And in my day job, my professional life, I serve as the executive director of the Downtown Columbia Partnership. And in that capacity, I've had the opportunity to partner with CA on lots of projects and that reflect our shared goal of making Columbia an outstanding community in which to live, work, and play. And I'm here tonight to publicly thank Lakey for her leadership in the way in which she has reignited passion in longtime employees and also hired some amazing new staff. In my interactions with CA team members at all levels throughout the organization, I'm always impressed by the professionalism, dedication, and creativity of the team. Most importantly, I'm thrilled with CA's willingness to now speak on issues that matter our, to our community and the values on which Columbia was founded. It makes me proud to have CA's president serve as a thoughtful and compassionate spoke spokesperson who encourages others to be thoughtful and compassionate. Lakey, thank you for waking CA from a long slumber and for your willingness to speak truth to power and revive CA's relevancy and moral compass. And having learned some new slang from Marcy Leonard tonight, I want to add that Lakey, Renee, Danica, Dennis, Nick, Tim, Jessica, Robin, Susan, the whole open space team are 100% vibe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Ellen. Phil, once is a happening, twice is interesting, three is a pattern. I'm curious, I've never seen people, and I've been on the board for over seven years, people come out speaking what my first assumption was randomly speaking positively about the uh, president. I'm curious as, if you know why that's so, that three people have done that. Well, I'd say you have a pretty fantastic president and leadership team on your hands. And I would say that a lot of the community is starting to wake up and pay attention to things at CA. And so you see these three as, as independent actors who happen to come together on the same night to speak about the same thing for those reasons? Unlike a lot of my neighbors, I don't work at NSA, so I'm not really into looking at patterns. <laughs> That's an interesting answer. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, guys. N next, we have uh, Dara Baker. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I'd like to um, thank the previous question because I was kind of curious myself as to <laughs> that. Um, my name is Dara Baker. I am a new resident of Columbia. I moved here just about a year ago. Um, I really would wish, love to be able to say that I have had the same marvelous, surprisingly only positive and overly incredibly marvelous experiences. Um, in my communications with the president of uh, the CA Boyd, uh, board, uh, Lakey Boyd, but I would have to fundamentally disagree. Um, I have sent numerous emails. I have had attempted communications. I have never received a response. Um, I have seen Lakey use the words of CA residents who are concerned about projects, including um, the stream restoration, against us, um, using them in an internal memo to the CA board. Um, and I sent my own uh, letter to the board on uh, May 31st in response to the comments from the May 26th meeting, um, in which I really do feel that there are, uh, I'm really, really concerned about the amount of transparency 
coming from the president to the board and the ability of uh, individuals like me to have our voice heard without getting pushed back from someone who does have that authority. And apparently um, a very, very large and suddenly um, voraciously uh, verbose fan club. Um, so I was here tonight mostly to sort of um, serve as backup and answer questions um, for anything on the stream project, but I, you know, I've had really positive experiences. We had a tree come down. We've had other stuff. I've called the open space. They've been fantastic. They've been wonderful. The staff is marvelous. Um, but I have not had anywhere near that experience. And there are some days that I really, I really wonder why I moved here if the people who live here don't care about um, the public spaces and don't care about the future and seem to be more interested in the bottom line and making income for CA. And that's my comment tonight. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Laura Bacon representing the third. Hello, everybody. Can you hey. hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, you can see the beautiful like Columbia Association curated <laughs> background behind me. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Laura Bacon. I am a Columbia baby. I was born and raised in the Oakland Mills neighborhood. Um, I've been, a, or I was a Howard County public school teacher for 14 years. And now I'm the head of a local, I'm the founder and the head of a local nonprofit called The Third that supports women of color entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you tonight about community and sort of my perspective as a community leader, but also as someone who is, has been a part of this community since birth. Um, it can be a little hard to define, so I'm gonna go ahead and just define it for myself. And I'm, the way that I'm gonna define it is as a verb. Um, and it's the act of joining arms and supporting and caring for the people, places, things in your world, whatever size that world is. What I feel from CA in the past year is community. Um, as a Columbia resident, I feel really hopeful about some of the larger organizations in our um, community as they really focus on community in a way that feels meaningful and not necessarily performative. Um, I feel this as an individual clearly, but I also feel it as an organization. I'm here to speak as an organization, so that's kind of where I will head. Um, as someone who's building a community-focused organization in Columbia, it felt like a natural fit to collaborate and come together with Columbia Association. And it feels for me like a natural fit to come together and collaborate with any organization that feels like they're trying to work towards the betterment of the Columbia and Howard County community. I will say that as an emerging nonprofit um, and someone who's been in this community for 40 years, I don't meet with the same amount of um, excitement about collaboration as I do when I work with CA. Um, all those names that uh, Phil put out, I'll, I'm gonna second them. They're a vibe, it's a vibe, Phil. I'll just tell you, a vibe, but that's all right. Um, I, I wanna talk about the leadership, but less about the person and more about the impact. So the impact that I've seen of the leadership is that I've just been able to meet with people from CA. It's been really great. And there's such amazing, wonderful people who are working there who are really trying to work to make sure that everyone in the community is seen, that um, residents are heard, and that programs and areas are ready for the community to take advantage of so that we can celebrate this amazing community that was built for us. Um, I, um, I first met our new president down at our first Juneteenth pop-up cookout last year. She brought her family and seemed right at home down by the lake, enjoying good food and good music, which feels like a Columbia tradition. Um, and the gift of this current leadership, as I said, is impact. So I've seen it. It's the gift of reaching out to teens. I mean, I remember being a teenager in Columbia and having like CA meetups at the other barn and it not feeling like this reciprocal sort of um, relationship where I was being seen and heard. And I've seen and actually helped to hopefully connect Lakey with NCA and Robin with these uh, teen organizations or with schools so that they can sit and talk through what it is for this new generation of children, what they need from us and from CA and from the community. 
Um, and mainly right now, it is the gift of getting to plot and plan for Columbia Association's first ever Juneteenth celebration, which is a collaboration that brings together Columbia Festival for the Arts, Howard Hughes and the Third, and the Downtown Columbia Partnership to celebrate Juneteenth, a historical and cultural celebration of Black history and culture. Look at all that joining of arms, supporting and caring for the people, places, and organizations in our very small little Howard County world. It sounds like community, and it fills me with hope and joy to see the positive movement of Columbia Association. To the many, many folks at Columbia Association who have helped to bring us the third into the community and embraced us so warmly and, and welcomingly, I will uh, leave you with some iconic words. Thank you for being a friend. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you as a community member and as, as the leader of an organization here in Columbia. Thank you, and, and good luck with your organization. Uh, Jenny? Thank you so much. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, could you maybe send us some more information on your organization? I would love to. Okay. What Thanks. would you like to know? Everything about it. <laughs> uh, what your okay. goals are, what you hope to accomplish, um, you know, whatever you think is relevant so that we would better understand what you want sure. for, for your organization to. and for the people that would actually belong to it and be served by it. Thank I would you. love to. We have over 120 members right now, so it's a okay. it's a it's a small organization that's growing very rapidly. Um, I'm really excited about what we're bringing to the community. Thank thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? I I got a question. Brian, uh, when are you opening? <laughs> the eternal question. So we as an organization are open. As I said, we have 115 members. We run programming for them, networking. Um, our community partnerships are open. We are clearly doing programming in the community to be able to connect people and amplify things for women of color entrepreneurs, um, like in Bus Boys, with Columbia Association, with Community Ecology Institute. But I'm sure you're talking about the space. And the space is opening as soon as humanly possible. Um, I don't know about you all, but it's been a little pandemic-y lately. And um, things have been taking and costing a little more than anyone could possibly anticipate. Um, and as someone who is doing something for the first time and really trying to push a vision and an innovative idea through, it's taking some time. So we're hoping by the end of June, but um, I'll put a little selfish plug in here. Next week, we will be having our Juneteenth celebration with CA, and prior to that, June 18th, we'll be having a Women of Color Art Expo with 21 local women of color artists who are featured and selling their art, as well as kid activities and, um, and other wonderful things. So please stop through. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for, te for your testimony. Thank you. Next have a good week, night. Good night. Next, we have uh, Deborah Westner. Good evening. I'm sorry, but you won't have a camera tonight. Unfortunately, mine is not working. I'm here to speak with you about the Lake Elkhorn Stream Restoration Project. It's going to impact 33,000 linear feet could, of could, stream banks. Excuse me. Could you turn up the volume a little bit or speak a little bit louder? It's coming a little soft. Yeah. Okay, I'll try that again. <laughs> I'm here to speak about the Lake Elkhorn Restoration Project. Um, as you know, it will impact 33,000 linear feet of eroded stream banks that are flowing into Lake Elkhorn. The CA board understands that the major budget impacts from dredging are huge, uh, with over 12 million being spent for the most recent dredging of the lakes. And there's also pond work to do. And the CA board has charged the staff with trying to reduce these costs. The staff has tried to find ways to do so. They obtained two major grants that helped residents offset the costs of installing rain gardens in a project called Slow the Flow. It was a very successful program, so much so that Howard County has tried to emulate it, though on a smaller scale. Unfortunately, the CA grant funds have been exhausted. CA staff has granted easements on some CA properties so that Howard County would undertake the effort and funding required to remediate these areas. In return, Howard County was able to capture TMDL credits or total maximum daily load credits that it needed to meet state and EPA requirements. 
in the most recently completed project ca worked with the state highway administration to grant them easements on ca property so they could remediate sections of streams that were causing erosion and sediment pouring into wild lake this remediation was done with state funds and will be maintained by the state for a fixed period of time under the original contract i have heard seriously the comments of those who are opposing the Lake Elkhorn Stream Restoration Project. They express concern about potential tree removal, forest clearing, and habitat loss that would be necessary to conduct the restoration work. I would point out that CA staff learned as a result of the Wild Lake Project the need to be more respectful of old trees, wildlife habitat, and people's perceived ownership of certain natural views out their back window. CA staff has told me that they intend to manage WSSI, the contractor for the Lake Elkhorn project, more closely than was considered necessary for the work at Wild Lake. CA staff has identified access points so that heavy equipment will not need to be using uh, inroads into the stream area that go through private property. CA will have old growth and unique trees marked as well as certain wildlife habitats so that WSSI does not disturb them. Mr. Chairman, oh. time has expired. Th thank you for your testimony. Do we, do we have any questions? No. No questions. Thank you. Next we have Robert Moyahan. Good evening, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk to the board. <clears throat> Specifically, uh, I'd like to address the proposed Lake Elkhorn Stream Restoration Mitigation Bank project. I'm a resident of the town center, a member of the Columbia Association Water Set Advisory Committee. I've walked and run that path between Lake Elkhorn and Jackson Pond many, many times and seen the damage. I'm also a retired professional civil engineer and licensed land surveyor who practiced in the area of stormwater design and management for over 35 years. I've evaluated the technical report document entitled Mitigation Bank Addendum 1 for Lake Elkhorn and want you to know that I support the project and believe that it meets in every way the CA goals of maintaining our lakes and ponds. While the board has been made aware of concerns of some residents, I wanna make certain you know three things. One, this is not an imminent project. It's still being reviewed by both the Army Corps and Maryland Department of the Environment. And it'll be this winter at the earliest before they respond to their review of the application. Number two, the current addendum document does not identify specific trees that will be impacted. As has been mentioned tonight, the addendum document only includes preliminary concept maps. There will be numerous opportunities to review details such as this after the Corps and MDE finish their review and after, if they approve the review, detailed plans are developed. Finally, you may hear arguments that the mitigation should happen at the source of the increase in stormwater runoff. In my practice, it was always preferable to design and install stormwater mitigation practices at the upstream point of the creation of the excess stormwater runoff. However, in areas that are already highly developed, like Columbia, the reality is that the ability to get agreements, funding sources, and commitments from hundreds of individually owned and fully developed properties to install, install stormwater runoff controls <coughs> is very unrealistic. So the proposal to restore the stream bed and surrounding areas to accommodate stormwater runoff makes the most practical sense. In conclusion, I'm asking the CA board members to hold off on any final judgments until the Army Corps and MDE have an opportunity to do a thorough and diligent review. And we've seen evidence tonight that they're asking a lot of questions. If then the project moves forward, and then detailed plans are prepared, then we can allow residents to respond to specific details in the plans, not preliminary assumptions. Finally, let me offer my experience and expertise to you if I could answer any questions or be of any assistance to the board. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ellen? Yeah, thank you, Richard. I'm wondering, 
On what basis, I, mean, I absolutely agree with you that we need all the available data we can get. What is your basis for saying that it's this winter at the earliest that an approval is going to happen? Is that somewhere in the documents or is that just based on your experience with these kinds of projects? Or? Yeah, well, more based on the experience and the time frame and the fact that they've given additional time for comments. They're taking it very seriously and they're being very deliberate. Okay, does that include, okay, thank you. Jay. Yeah, um, would that include uh, the opportunity for the public to be able to comment before any final decision? Once, my understanding is once the core and MDE review it, if they approve the application, and there's still a lot of questions before they will approve that because they're asking a lot of questions, but if those questions are answered to their satisfaction and they approve the application, then as I understand, plans can be produced or they, that will show what the mitigation effects will actually be. And while those plans are produced, uh, there would be comment periods, uh, both for CA and the residents of Columbia, to review those and ask questions as they have been on these other projects that were done locally. Well, thank you, I guess that, that really is, thank you, Jeannie, for your question, because that really is my question too, in terms of, it's one thing to have questions, but my, my question to you is, so if a resident has questions, or CA has questions, does that have any impact other than asking a question? Impact on? On the, on, on the project, on the decision to move forward, past that question? Certainly any, anything the CA asks or residents ask that get passed on to the Army Corps and MDE will have an effect on how they're, they're evaluating the project, certainly. So they would have, a, they would have the ability, once they've given permission to pull that permission back or change it or modify something? Yes, if they approve the project uh, application, and that's all it is, an application, uh, they would still be reviewing these plans as, as would the public. Th thank you, any further questions? Thank you for your testimony. I have a question. Uh, sorry, at this point, it's just questions from the board. I have a question. Uh, sorry, at this point, it's just questions from the board, not questions from residents. Thank you. Uh, and our last speaker tonight is Joel Hurwitz. Joel, are you there? Good evening, everybody. Mm -hmm. Hear me? Yes. Yes. Here we go. All right. I'm Joel Hurwitz, member of the Harper's Choice Board, I'm speaking for myself today. On generally what we could be called following the rules and procedures. First is the decision and order for the Board of Appeals in Lakeview that the CA was part of was issued on May 26th, purportedly. It's complicated by the fact that Bill Santos was a member of the board and Brian England was an opponent. Um, this afternoon, the other one of the other opponents, Chris Oliva, filed the motion for reconsideration. My view is that there is no valid decision and order because Bill Santos and Gene Ryan did not properly sign it in their own person, but did it by proxy. There's no procedure in the county code or the rules procedure to sign document by proxy. It says it has to be signed by the voting members of the board. The county code clear that when there are exceptions for having agents or proxies, they make it clear in the code because interpreting statutes, the Court of Appeals has said that the council is presumed to have said what it meant and meant what it said. Um, furthermore, it was attested by the purported secretary, Ashley Aguilar, which I don't believe is legally the secretary, because again, the, the code and the rules require that the appointing authority is the Board of Appeals, and apparently the Board of Appeals has never actually appointed the secretary, and certainly not Ms. Aguilar. Furthermore, she attested to her own work in, in signing on behalf of the other members, not only is for the signing the DNO itself, but certification that they listened to the recording that they missed. Does not comply, I think, with the state law on the replies, you know, from rule on the charter ads. 
I'd like you to talk about it because the board of uh, planning board is taking it up next week on the remand. It's complicated again, but I believe as you discussed your ethics rules, and I believe you were wrong last time with this or the May meeting that every member of the CA has a right to vote on every member of matter that comes before you, even though you have these conflicts. Mm -hmm. If you were to have a policy to do otherwise, you could actually reduce the size of your quorum. And I hope that also while you're updating it, you remove the compensation provision that's in conflict with the bylaws, it's in your ethics policy. And for your board policies, I'm glad you're looking at that, and I hope you codify them similarly to the uh, HCPSS. But I also hope you look at the, op the uh, other policies and procedures, including the open space rule that says you're closed at dusk to dawn. I brought this up before the pandemic, and I believe Dennis Maddy had it on his list. You have fishing rules that only apply to a wild Mr. lake. Mr. Chairman, time has expired. Thank, thank you. Do, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, um, Joe, um, what do you actually want the CA to do, the CA management to do? I'm not quite sure I understand. Which matter are you talking about, Brian? Oh, the, the first matter, the one to do with Lakeview. It, since CA was opposing it, I think you should continue to assert yourself because I believe that CA, as an adjacent property owner, is the only one that legally has standing if anybody chose to go to circuit court on any of these matters. Um, I've been bothered for some time by not only the Board of Appeals, but the Zoning Board and others that haven't been properly signing things according to the county code. Um, and other procedural issues that I have brought to the attention of the county staff for three months as well as Chris Oliva, and they have yet to act on any of them. Um, I believe that because Mr. Santos is no longer on the board, they could only get two to two vote if they were to re-execute the document at, at this time. And therefore, it would be denied. I guess they might try to wait until September, October to get another fifth member replacement and try to redo it again. Um, but there are some procedural problems if they ever should have gotten it. They took a vote and then they had a reconsideration before they should have because you can only reconsider after the DNO, not two minutes later when the petitioner's attorney groveled for it. So again, there are a lot of procedural problems and CA has the best ability to um, prosecute them if they chose to do so. Alan? Well, so given that they are procedural questions, I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out what concretely would be achieved besides delaying. Uh, if they stick with the rule that a 2-2 vote is a denial, then it would be denied. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you for your testimony. That concludes the resident speak up for tonight's work session. To limit interruptions during the board discussion, all members of the general public will now be returned to the audience. This means you'll no longer be able to show your camera or unmute your audio, but you are more than welcome to stay as an attendee to watch the remainder of the work session. You can also watch a live stream on the CA live stream YouTube page. Thank you so much for your participation tonight. I will now take a moment to allow our staff to make this transition. What, I'm not sure what the proper term is, order, information, whatever. I'd like some clarity on our resident speak out procedures. My understanding is that board members can ask questions but not make statements. There, there have been many times over the past years that I would have loved to have asked staff to follow up on something, answer a question from, from, the, uh, from a resident, 
or respond to what a resident said. My understanding is our policies prohibit all that, and yet we had a board member tonight turn to another staff member and, and ask for that staff member's opinion. So I'd like some clarity on what is our procedure. So I believe our procedure is we can ask questions. The questions can go to uh, the, the resident speaking out, but also questions can be fielded by, by staff. If we can ask questions I, I to staff. Great, thank case. you. At least that's been the case in my experience. Um, next. We have work session topics. First work session topics are the advisory committees. So at the last meeting we had uh, each of the advisory committees, they, they gave a presentation to us and they also discussed their, uh, their charges. Um, and so, the, so now it's, we have 15 minutes to discuss um, any possible questions um, on the uh, presentations and any possible proposed changes to the charges on the advisory committees. So do we have any questions on this topic or comments? Dick. Uh, yes, um, we uh, voted to uh, eliminate uh, board liaison on a number of these committees and uh, the feedback we got seemed to be that the committees wanted their um, board liaisons to continue. Is this something we want to revisit at some point? Any discussion on this? So I believe that would require a change in the policy that we approved right. in April. So that would have to get on the agenda as a modification to the current policy. Okay. Sure. Good. Yeah, um, the way most of these things, if I'm recalling, were handled in the past, and I, I'd have to look it up. But um, once a policy is voted on, it's, you really don't revisit it for another year so that you give the new policy time to, uh, to see whether it's working or not. And then if you need to make modifications, you can come back in the, the next session and look at it again. So it sounds like- so it, it sounds like to make some sense. So it sounds like this would be a good topic for the next April uh, meetings. Yeah, may have to get on the agenda yeah. if people feel that it's so, significant. So, so yeah, if you're on the April uh, Board of Operations Committee, that, that'd be a good thing to add to the agenda. I, Bill? I think Mr. Klein was before me, but I'll answer after him. I just, I just want to get clarification from Sherry. Were you stating what you believe to be best practice, or were you stating something that's in our policies? I believe that was our policy. That we have to wait a year to change a policy. Yeah, yeah. or it was, was either a policy or a procedure, or it was the way but it was topics something, were handled. It was, but it was, that was an agreement that the board voted on and passed? That I don't know, okay. but I just know that that's the way it was handled in the past okay. so that you don't constantly go back and keep revisiting the same thing and never okay. moving on. Thank you. It would take a fair amount of time to get it on a future agenda anyway because it would have to go through the, mm -hmm. the necessary procedures, get on the agenda and have the necessary readings. Uh, Bill? Yeah, just a, a quick comment here because it, it seems to me, I, I was not here for the April vote. Um, I had not been on the board yet. But based on the feedback we got from the advisory committees that the, the board may have acted with imperfect information. Um, and if that's the case, there, there may be a, a, a grounds for revisiting the, the procedure mm -hmm. earlier. Um, and, and that may not be covered in the actual existing procedure to amend procedures. But, but I think the case could be made that maybe in this case, the, the information was not complete um, for whatever reason and, and sooner uh, change may be warranted. I, I just wanted to put that out mm -hmm. there. Uh, Dick? Uh, yes, I guess we'll find out as we go through that policy book what the policy <laughs> is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm wondering, as you recall, was it 12 months later we'd look or when another board came in? Because we now have a, a new board that might want to review some of the policies. The I, I, I honestly don't know. Okay, well, I honestly we'll, don't we'll know. soon find out. Yeah. Janet? We'll try it. I, I just wanted to remind everyone that there's nothing prohibiting people from attending the committee meetings for any of these committees. So if you feel strongly about the aquatics committee, by all means attend the aquatics committee. The idea behind removing a required board liaison was to prevent the board from getting in the way of the committee because typically the staff member and the committee are the ones directing. If they want board input or feedback, then they know where to find it, or 
if someone feels strongly about a particular committee, then there's nothing stopping you from attending those meetings. Alan? Yeah, I absolutely get that. That's, that's not a problem. I guess I'm very curious and concerned about the notion of a board member getting in the way of a board advisory committee. I and mean, that's what these committees are. They're to advise the board, not to advise the staff. And so it seems like we ought to be integral parts of that. I, and I would ask, what has the board member contributed to those committees in the past other than a sounding board, which they can still do? According to the committees, they've talked about appreciating members who, who come, that is appreciating the stability of having, knowing who they can talk to, having someone they see as their liaison spokesperson to the, uh, to the whole board. That was what was brought out at our last meeting. Bill? Just a point of information. As a former member of the Columbia Aquatics Advisory Committee for like nine years, I can't remember a single instance when a board member was interfering with the actual operation of the, you know, I think Ginny tried once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, when she wanted that private I'm pool in her backyard, that, that was a little too far. I'm, I'm totally kidding. That, the, the try, inappropriate. I apologize. Try. But uh, I, Thanks, Bill. In, in nine years, I don't think we ever had a board member interfere. I just want to provide that point. <laughs> Janet? Perhaps interfering is a, too strong of a word. Sure. I would just like to say that is this really something Thing that is like we have a lot of things that we could talk about we've already spent 10 minutes talking about this when there's nothing in the current policy that changes the, our ability to support any of our advisory committees so I'd like us to think about how we spend our time and how we focus our time and not spend unnecessary time on things that have not a huge impact well I, I'll just make a Quick comment. I, th I think there's also an optics issue. Having a board member as an official liaison has a different optics than having board members. Well, fall and that would have been an excellent point to bring up when we discuss the policy. Duly noted. Um, at the same time, this this sounds like, given the discussion, this sounds like a, a good topic for a future uh, BOC to be added on a future agenda. But Andy, yeah. no, I was going to say, can we get back to the actual topic on the agenda, which was the charges? Um, I think overall they're pretty good. Um, I did have one question on the, um, the Climate Advisory Committee. I mean, they were talking about the, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, just a minute. Which, uh, which page? Um, trying to get it. Page three of the, of the, yeah. um, I don't know which packet. It's the third uh, committee. Yeah. There's no yeah. page number, so. Since um, build on the, uh, the CVA, which is the uh, Columbia Vulnerability Assessment, and boost engagement with Wait, marginal... Where, where, where which which where section? Oh, page three. Sorry. Um, Climate Change and Sustainability Advisory Committee report. Yeah, but what, um, what's the heading? Which heading? B, proposed charges. B? Yes, B, okay. proposed charges. Yeah. One, which section? Two, three, four. The fourth one down. Build, um, build CVA. Yeah, it talks about, you know, marginalized communities and tree equity score. Um, and I think the question that popped in my mind is, um, I guess when I, when I look at this wording and I'm thinking um, of the marginalized communities, that's generally an area. Um, and I'm thinking, are we saying that there are areas in Columbia that are marginalized? Because I'm not sure that's what I want to say. How would you propose rewarding this? Well, that's, that's why I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what this actual phrasing meant. Well, um, you know, I mean, generally you think about um, marginalized community. I mean, I think like, I mean, areas of Baltimore City that, um, you know, have roads put through, have um, uh, you know, incinerators built next to them, those types of things. Um, and it's just that I don't see that as kind of happening in Columbia. Um, and so I, I do wonder about the word, you know, I understand, you know, you certainly want to approach um, people who don't feel like they're part of Columbia as we had people tonight talk about, you know, and how uh, we interact with them. Um, 
but it just it's just I'm not sure that that kind of applies to Columbia itself. Not that there aren't areas in Howard County that could fall under that definition, but I just don't think that Columbia itself has an area that I would consider marginalized. Eugenie? Oh yeah, well the CVA relates to uh, Wild Lake. Wild Lake is the pilot, uh, and they're going to be working with Wild Lake in the second yep. steps. I understand that. Um, okay. And, just, and just, what I, I would, would suggest not. you do is uh, get a hold of the chair, Tim okay. Vladimir, and just ask him uh, your question. Okay. Yeah, if, if that word can be changed, but it, it definitely is referring to Wild Lake. And then if other villages are interested, okay. they can expand. Well, now you made me worried because I, I do not want to refer to Wild Lake. No, I, I, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, are you going to be the one that will talk to Tim? Do you want me to do that? What do you want? Yeah, you're the liaison. I'll okay, do all right, I'll talk to him. Yeah, sorry. And Jeremy is also one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if we, if we can come up with a yeah. better wording, we yeah. can yeah. get that yeah. in the. Uh, I mean, whatever, if you want, yeah. For, for the vote, uh, Ellen. I guess I guess I'm. It's interesting, Andy, that you had that concern. For me, marginalized is is a relative term. It's not an absolute term. So for me, marginalization within Columbia is is relative to privilege and, and so on in, in some area in other areas of Columbia. So and so I just I just have to say for me it doesn't if that's the word the committee wants to use, that's that could fit for me. It's also interesting in, in my experience, and this is Field I work in a lot is the people who who experience marginalization know they experience marginalization. It's those of us who don't experience who get concerned with with naming it. And I think I'd be much more comfortable just us owning it and naming it that it's something that can happen and does happen in Columbia. Uh, Bill, I just think if you're trying to find a euphemism for Wild Lake. Just say Wild Lake. We would be happy to engage with the watershed or the, the sustainability uh, and environmental committee. Um, th this seems kind of odd to use some sort of terms which I think are a little bit negative to, to discuss Wild Lake. Why don't you just say Wild Lake? Okay. Um, well, if you go to the previous page, it, here it explains it more and it deals with Wild Lake. A, first bullet. Right. Okay. And then this is just some how they plan on adding to what they've already done. Right. Well, but it doesn't say marginalized. Yeah, no, I, I heard you. Yeah. But if you yeah. want to say Wild Lake, say Wild Lake. That, yeah, okay. that makes sense to me. And, yeah. And Actually, I had written Wild Lake there, but go ahead. Sherry? Now, is, is this um, a pilot kind yes. of project? Well, maybe that's part of what needs to be added here. Um, because I was reading boost engagement as being the, the driver, um, and I thought there were multiple communities, but if you're going to be using Wild Lake as the pilot, boost engagement on a pilot project with Wild Lake by harnessing additional information, I think that would be, that would be fine. Yeah, and one of the discussions while they're working with Wild Lake is are there other villages that might want them to go speak to them about this pilot and then work a process for those other villages where they may want to get involved. It would be, you know, a timeline there. You wouldn't do it right away, but that would be the process they, they are willing to do. Yeah, okay, okay. Could, all yeah, right, we'll yeah, get back you, to you on yeah, that. Could, yeah, can you send me, Sherry, could uh, you send me the exact wording so we can up update? Update this for okay. the yeah. thanks. <laughs> and NCC, NCC, uh, Lakey and uh, and Dennis, uh, Lakey. Uh, I I just wanted to echo and support Alan's comments. Um, I I think marginalized community, in my experience, um, one has a socioeconomic definition often in relativity to the community it's located in, and we definitely have um, marginalized communities in Columbia, in, in my opinion, um, from a professional assessment standpoint. And then I would say particularly because it calls out the idea of engagement in, I think that really stresses the idea of the people that do not feel like they have been engaged with, which um, in my experience, there, there's quite a few people in Columbia that feel like CA, 
and our efforts either from a staff standpoint or from a volunteer standpoint have not effectively engaged them. So mm -hmm. just as context. Thanks. Any, any further questions on this topic? On, on uh, the millennial one, I think they were talking about changing the title. Which, which section? Um, millennial Advisory Committee, just the overall. I think they were talking about changing the title to 18 to 35, and uh, Colin Sullivan, the chair, made that comment, and I happened to be talking to him about another issue and asked him if they were going to propose an amendment. And he said he'd be getting to the committee, and I said, well, I think if you want that, you should be sending it in writing to the entire board. So as of this date, I don't think we've heard anything. No. But they seem to think that would be better than uh, this title. Isn't it, Sherry, they're aging out anyway, right? <laughs> That's yeah. right. It, so, so, so it doesn't make any so sense. Does this yeah. committee have an age limit or age bounds, or is it by generation? I, th I think th I think it was done originally um, by by age. So yes, there are, there are some people who have been very active yeah. who feel that they're aging out. Thirty six, um, and they're all. So I I think that should be looked at again um, because I see no reason why people should not be able to stay engaged as representatives um, if they've been working on these issues. Yeah, I mean, the question is: Should it be age based or by your birth based? Kevin? So there, the generations for my one of my previous jobs, you know, you, uh, there's X, Y, Z, and there, the dates aren't quite perfect in terms of what people's ages are. Uh, so it's it's a little bit of a floating topic. There are some experts if you do some research on it to see um, which generation you're trying to target in terms of giving services to. Um, but it seems to me uh, it's. Generation Y and Z are the ones that we're looking to to help with that that group. So, Jenny. Okay. Yeah, you have uh, a teen and middle school committee. Mm -hmm. You have a senior committee, and then you have this. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah. What sh so they're, they're saying, make it an age thing. Yeah. yeah. Dick. Yeah, it seems that the target here is not millennials; it's young adults. And the millennials are moving out of that age category. Bill? As the liaison to the millennial committee, I, I think at this point we ought to leave this <laughs> as named and let them decide it because none of us are millennials or young adults at this point. <laughs> 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 because, oh, hey, hey, oh hey, that just, hurts. Young at heart, yes. <laughs> it hits all of us, I understand that. <laughs> As defined in their report, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think we ought to put something in their goals that says to reconsider the name and, and report back yeah. to the board. Then that would capture it and then we could have that discussion. And that seems to be the, 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 the way to make this happen. I, I guess in my possibly make it a little more flexible so that people that identify um, as millennials and not having strict cutoffs. Um, any further uh, questions on this, uh, this segment? You have a question? I, just, I was in agreement that, I mean, I remember when we formed this, and at that time, millennials were the young adults. Right. And so we, we forgot that people age and eventually millennials are going to be senior citizens and that's committee's not really <laughs> that was not the intention of the committee the intention was young adults mm -hmm. okay any, any further questions comments all right next on our agenda is village excess cash reserves uh, uh, Susan can you give a overview of the uh, cash reserve policy oh, sure so uh, first of all um, two things. One, the excess cash um, calculation is something that's established in the management contract. So that's been in place since 2019 and uh, or actually in FY18, sorry. And that um, I did not have an in-depth discussion with the village managers, but I did share have a brief discussion with them at the end of April, very brief, and then shared the material with them um, last week. Uh, and I would just start out by saying that we're, um, the CA staff is, essentially agrees with the recommendations that, or the requests that the village managers made 
uh, in their letter that was attached, um, just with a couple, uh, actually a couple additions and uh, one clarification and one change. So um, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but the, I would just say that, um, and I haven't, I don't think I mentioned, I have not heard anything from anybody since the material was distributed. So. So since 2018, FY18, there have been some changes to the uh, cash reserve formula um, that have resulted in providing additional cash, or the villages retaining more cash um, than they had before. And that one of which was the elimination, uh, which uh, was a joint decision of the contingency fund. And so $304,000 from that um, was distributed among the uh, village community associations and that was excluded from the excess cash reserve calculation. That calculation already excludes uh, bills in the pipeline, escrow deposits, uh, loan balances, things like that. So it's, it's truly not what, uh, it already takes out into consideration um, cash that might possibly be needed in ordinary operations. Uh, and then given the impact of the pandemic on operations in FY21, um, the CA board and the um, approved uh, additional modifications. So um, at that time, the board approved using an average, a three-year average of expenses, which is a component of the formula, as opposed to just one year, and um, excluding any uh, grants and uh, CARES Act distributions or loans, et cetera. So, uh, and also at that time, the board um, approved um, that if in the event of excess cash um, being returned to CA, that those funds would be used within those villages, uh, returning the funds for um, projects or activities focused on environmental sustainability. So uh, the going moving to the recommendations, uh, and also I did want to uh, let you know that um, while we provided some information on data on fiscal year ends of village cash and investments for through FY21. We only had third quarter results for this year, so that's why there are two uh, uh, graphs here showing um, that position. We don't have the final or the numbers for uh, April 30, but so as of the end of January 2022, um, in combined total, the villages have um, $3,473,000 in, in cash and investments. So uh, we, the villages, uh, village managers requested that the um, calculation be based on an average of three years, FY19, FY20, and FY22. Um, so you'll note that FY21 was excluded, and um, we agree with um, excluding FY21 as an anomaly that year being so impacted by the pandemic, it doesn't make sense to include it. But on the other hand, we, we also think that FY19 should be excluded because uh, that is a pre-pandemic uh, um, number that uh, no organization is really seeing um, now. It, doesn't, it seems equally irrelevant um, from our perspective. Um, and then um, the, they, the request was made to exclude grants, tax credits, uh, loans, CARES Act distributions, et cetera, from the calculation. So as I noted, loans are all, unpaid loan balances are already excluded. And we agreed, we just wanted to clarify that it would be, uh, those funds received in FY22 would be excluded from FY22, because uh, uh, otherwise they would have been partially spent or perhaps 100% spent, and there would be no way of, of validating that. So third, um, uh, back in uh, late April, it was very late in the fiscal year, um, the CA staff uh, determined that uh, th the villages should receive, uh, or we recommended additional annual chair, annual charge uh, share funds. And um, I wanna correct an error that I have in here. I said the increase was 10.7%. The increase over the final FY21 amount was 3.4. The 10.7 was, was, was measuring that $356,000 against the, previous, the grant amount, the preliminary grant amount. So, so we're proposing that that would be excluded from the FY22 cash, um, excess cash reserve calculations, the village managers did not request that, but I really just think that was because of the timing of that communication. And then finally, we, we suggested uh, and recommended that um, if there are 
uh, excess cash reserves or fun excess cash funds returned to CA that again that um, concept of using those funds in the village uh, returning them for environmentally sustainable projects would make sense again and then last I just wanted to, to point out that um, so this is this is a significant amount of, of, of funds of cash in the custody of the villages and just uh, felt that it was the prudent and responsible on, on our part to suggest and recommend that the community associations have um, cash reserve policies similar to what CA uh, implemented a couple years ago and investment policies that just make it very clear, uh, very transparent, and provide some guide rail, uh, guidance and guardrails around those funds. That's not... Uh, you know, part of the, rec the recommendation governing these funds, but it's just a, ge a general um, concern and suggestion. Thank you. Janet? Uh, will villages have influence over which environmental projects, or is that a CA? No, they've been, uh, it's been collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kevin? Um, so I generally agreed with the letter that I read from all the village managers in terms of was that responded to? Did we respond to that? Uh, so this is the response to that. Okay. This, this okay. activity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure they're clear on what our board and organization is saying. Response. To. So yeah, yeah. This, yeah. this is for you okay. to decide on. This is staff's um, response to okay. that. Are we doing that today, or is that at the next, next board meeting? It's at the next okay. meeting. Okay. Just checking. Take up time to newbie here. <laughs> okay, Dick. Uh, I really appreciate you working with the villages on this. Uh, I was wondering, have they seen this iteration with your comments? So they've had a chance. I, to I sent it to them on Friday. Okay, uh, same as when you got well, it. Well, it's uh, it's true. Thank you. Alan, yeah, a couple of things. I I'm not aware or clear what, what is the management contract something that's written into a, a law or a, or a charter or a body? Where, where's the sort of provenance for that come from? So the management contract is, it's a contract between the Columbia Association right. and each village, one by one. But so it's what, a contract. Is there a requirement that that contract be entered into? Uh, other than to be able to use the buildings and get the grant, no. Okay. So where, what, one thing I'm confused about in what you wrote is where does the responsibility, I get that we have a right to collect an annual charge, but when you add the phrase in its entirety, mm -hmm. to, to me I read that as, and that includes stuff that goes to the villages. So I, absent a requirement for an annual contract, it seems to me we could charge an annual charge and not give anything to the village. Not that we'd want to, but, but so I'm not sure where right and responsibility come from. We do it, but I'm not sure where those words right and responsibility. Oh, it's responsibility unrelated to the management contract. So the deed uh, and, co and and declaration, to the Columbia Association's deed, uh, is what drives and. Um, governs the annual charge. That we can do an annual charge, but Correct. that we then grant some of it to the villages. It's, at, it's completely silent. There's it's nothing silent that, that says. And so that's why I, I think it's a little bit, we can certainly collect, it's our right and responsibility to collect an annual charge, I guess for me, that in its entirety, what particularly combined with the previous sentence about the pass through and all that makes it sound like it's our right and responsibility to do this with the pass through or with the collect money for the villages. And that's not my understanding. My understanding that's been a long standing agreement, but not a right and responsibility. But anyway. I, I don't, I don't um, thank you for your input. Okay. The, in, the last comment you made about villages having an investment reserve policy, do you envision that if, if a village has an investment policy, and I'll just make up pretend numbers, and the village decides to invest within its policy $500,000, would those 500,000 be considered part of their excess or would those be, do you envision that being 
used by the village and therefore not part of the excess? That's not the nature of an investment policy. So the investment policy would provide guidance around how the excess cash, any cash in the custody of, of the village mm -hmm. was invested, right. not... Uh, so so not, I'm asking you, if a right. village decided to invest, so let's suppose a village had 500,000 in excess cash, or what would have been 500, but instead they decide to invest that 500,000. Would uh, that, that's would, would you, do relevant. you envision considering that they still have 500,000 excess cash? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to get that clear. Last question, I, I'm, a, and I wasn't here, I don't think, when this environmental policy, which I'm all in favor of putting money towards the environment, it seems to me that, that in, the environment doesn't end where a village boundary ends. And so I guess I'm a little concerned with just dropping money to a particular village that happened to have some excess cash. That might not be the best environmental use of that money to benefit Columbia. If the village wanted to use the money to benefit its environment, they could have used the money to do that, it would seem to me. So I'm, I guess, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the, the direct, if there's excess, it goes back to the environment in that particular village. It also raises the possibility that there would be a need that that excess wouldn't cover. And so then what do you do? Now do we? Um, so this would be the excess that would be returned to CA. Right, I get that. Okay, so um, I think it was um, a, appealing to villages in the situation where funds were leaving their village to go back to CA, CA to have a, uh, a use for those funds um, in a way that still benefited the whole community but was specific to their village. So I, get, I, I get that. I guess for me, environmental things are bigger than villages, so that it, I, it's not your decision, but it concerns me that that's, I'd want us to talk about so that. So these are generally quite small dollars. Uh, so if we're planting trees in a village, for example, is one of the, the uses of the funds this year. Okay, so thank Jenny. you. Yeah, uh, Alan, if you want to follow up with, uh, I don't know, Lakey, Dennis, uh, John McCoy, he's working on a, a project in Oakland Mills and he's taken the whole board out to see different um, places where we can clean up the stream and uh, prevent further erosion, et cetera, with this money. And the streams, depending on where it's going, it's going to help a lot of villages. So, uh, you know, it's really, really pretty good. And it, there's a partnership there. Now, I think it may also cost CA a little bit, but not as much as it would have cost to do that. You know, th that little bit of money doesn't always pay for the entire project. But it's, it's a good example of how uh, I think it's working. Bill? Yeah, um, I was just wondering if you thought, we, we have an upcoming training opportunity. Do you think it would be a good idea, Susan, if we, we sat down and maybe discussed the cooperative endeavor w with this board and, and how the, the boards interrelate so they could get a greater understanding of, I mean, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, all of these things, the, the annual charge, the um, building, you know, operation and maintenance, the, the in-kind things that are done, those are all board-directed initiatives from this board for the, the village boards, right? That, that We just don't do it as a matter of cause. We that That's something the boards ask to be done, right? That the village boards ask for? Well, no, that the, the, the CA board said, we're going to have a policy that we will collect the annual charge and then distribute a, a, an assessment share to each village. Right. Right, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So I think that if, if at the upcoming training, if we could talk through all of that kind of stuff. That is planned. Oh, that's great. Okay. And then we'll talk about the, the accounts payable and the backbone that the CA had that the villages didn't. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to charge their own assessment if they correct. wish and all that right. kind of stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, yep. yeah. Any, any further questions or comments? So th this is uh, going to come up for a vote at the next meeting. Um, definitely something I recommend uh, discussing with your villages and your village managers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, ne next on the agenda is the uh, President's CEO goals and objectives. Okay, 
Okay, so all this information is in your packet. Um, at the Board Operations Committee, the chair and vice chair asked me to keep my presentation, not a full presentation, but a, a very brief one. So I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly. Um, so I kept similar to um, my first year, assuming this will cooperate, there we go. Um, pretty much the same areas of focus. I think they're all still relevant, but have slightly updated the goals and then uh, correspondingly updated the objectives. So around stewardship of resources, really making sure that our allocation process enhances the functionality that is needed across a very complex organization. So taking what has been an ethos that has existed of responsible and responsive fiscal stewardship and really keeping what started during COVID out of pure necessity. Uh, we continued it this past year and have been successful at much more closely managing cost of revenue as well as really trying to push capital improvements forward, which feeds into my next point, uh, is a pretty significant challenge these days. And that is based on really needing to pretty constantly adapt to the challenges that are happening across supply chain, uh, inflation, and staffing. Uh, one place that we have made some strides um, over this last year is increasing supplier diversity. And while that is important, obviously, to diversity, equity, and inclusion, one of the things that I have really been stressing internally is that it also allows us to much um, more concisely often address our supply chain issues by really changing up who our vendors are and some of their abilities, particularly a local versus a national or, the, or those kind of components are at play. Um, I do want to clearly state in, in this meeting in particular at the start, we're only a month into the fiscal year and I am going to say now that achieving the budgeted goals uh, will be an absolute win. Um, it is already markedly more challenging than it was two months ago, let alone we're 100 plus days into the war that when we adopted this budget and we're finalizing it was not even underway. So the kinds of impacts that are going to persist and we expect to intensify um, given some other global issues that are happening, national, but really the impact on um, what we're seeing on delivery costs, on gas costs. I mean, every single component we're dealing with has a multiplier that um, is shifting based on purchasing almost on a daily basis. Uh, and the, the hiring challenges still exist. Uh, and then lastly, continuing making sure that we have a robust feedback loop in our budget process, particularly around hearing directly from the community on resource allocation. Um, relevance is a key partner. So really the focus is reestablish, you know, what once CA was absolutely known as a progressive community organization and a community leader. So uh, formalizing some uh, informal initiatives with respected partners, particularly around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that is both inside CA and continuing to really um, expand, which we have been doing our DE&I efforts with our employee committee, but also those external partnerships that have started informally. Uh, as was just referenced, we will be starting the process of the collaborative way that CA staff and village board, excuse me, village managers work to update the management contract. So in order for that to be in time for the next five year cycle, we'll be working through that process and continuing to strengthen those relationships um, in that more formal way as well. Expanding the connections with both stakeholders and organizations. Uh, this is a definite continuation of what has, I've really been focused on this past year, both with long established organizations as well as um, ones that I'm often met with, I've never met anyone from CA. Um, so I think we are still making strides there. There's still a lot of ground to, to make up for sure. And then creating more intentional and strategic partnerships. I think that we've really been focused internally on 
a reputation that we had stopped so much during COVID. Uh, a lot of how CA was seen, um, quite frankly, was as a logo on a poster somewhere and perhaps a check. And we are trying to be much more engaged in how those partnerships are occurring and how we can make sure that we're having a more impactful community outcome. Uh, community engagement. So really increasing directly with community stakeholders. Obviously we have systems, the CA board is one of ways that people are represented in Columbia, but really making sure that we are having that direct feedback loop and able to be responsive in that. So continuing in um, our online, but also mailings, we are converting our um, annual mailing to really leverage the ability at the place we hit the most people and contact the most people that we're including a survey to get feedback on uh, CA, making sure that we're events, um, we're present, but we're also interactive and always getting feedback. Our digital experience is ongoing. Um, we are slated and expecting this fall to have, as I've talked about and um, Tim Pinnell has discussed previously, we have been doing iterative updates. Um, I've gotten some feedback from some of you individually that we've made improvements there and also from the community. We have a markedly long way to go. Um, but in fall, there will be not a complete revamp, but uh, an overhaul that I think will be much more noticeable. Another piece of that will also be um, our ongoing process that we're in for scoping our CRM, which will hopefully be starting to build that proposal this fiscal year. Uh, obviously staying engaged in the Howard County planning processes, both the public forums, but also our role in ensuring that residents are aware and educated on how to engage, and then continuing, but taking the step to expand the interactive sessions we've already started around community topics that CA has a role in and making sure that that is something we have been made um, connecting directly with the 10 villages to make sure they're helping us get the word out for those kind of topics all recorded and, and then living on the website. And then lastly, the next normal and operations that we really are um, now, even though, I mean, we're in a, we're in a surge again. So um, again, we're not out. We're now testing out the term of pandemic influenced. So we are emerging, but we are all changed, um, you know, as humans, as organizations. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're being wise about what we pull forward and, and what we shed. So continuing to lead the senior team and making sure that our operations are functioning well, that our team structure, our positions are aligned with the outcomes. Um, the realignment that I did last year continues to prove the benefit in the next bullet point around collaborative and cross-functional. That's happening internally in work groups to, to look at things. I um, mean, we've reported out on that, but also you're seeing a lot of more of that programming and we're getting both um, employee feedback as well as resident and member feedback that our results are better. Uh, definitely a top priority of mine is continuing to express the, the gratitude, but really making sure that we're supporting CA team members and able to be engaging that we are a desired employer and that we retain. Um, and that's not only based on the hiring challenges, it's really based on the kind of culture that we want to uh, keep and retain. And we are seeing the early indicators, we are attracting a higher caliber of talent as we deal with the hiring challenges. Um, we've been very pleased with how we have waded through that process and some uh, recent hires that have just been made. Um, and then lastly, and, and this will be a journey, um, really the purposeful use of data. I have, I have been trying to push this term. We have a ton of data. We have a ton of information. It's on a lot of paper and it's in a lot of, as people like to point, it's right up here. So we need to get that out of people's brains and onto electronic information. Um, and we are in that process. 
we have to really have it more accessible to then make it visible, to then have it drive decision making. And it's uneven. Um, we're doing it well in some teams and we're at the beginning of that process in others. But we're using smart sheets um, as our backbone and really able to convert a lot of information that exists into a more visible format and dashboard. So that's something that I have been very excited about and our new director of IT that's been with us about six months has been instrumental in. So just to give you an example. Um, and that is it, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and uh, before I go into the questions, I will just remind the board that this is something that the board will vote on and, and approve at a future meeting. Uh, Ellen. Does future mean in two weeks, or does future mean, is that when it's up for I believe in two weeks. Okay. A couple of questions for you, Lake. Going back to the first slide, I'm not, well, first question is, usually I think, one aligns something with something else. So what do you mean by aligning CA's responsible and responsive fiscal stewardship of resources? Aligning it to what? I'm just not clear what, the, what that would look like. Didn't mean I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what you're which Usually you say, I want to align oh, here our costs. Okay. It's the first bullet mm -hmm. on your first mm -hmm. page. I want to align our costs with our revenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I want to align uh, projects with staff or mm -hmm. needs or whatever. So, we're so it, it's aligning something. that our fiscal stewardship, so our overall budget, our overall financial approach, our overall cash reserves, align with managing cost to revenue and making sure okay. that we're actually implementing capital projects and not getting so strained in the challenges that are happening around supply chain and inflation. Got it. Thank Sorry, you. I didn't understand. Um, and you said we, we have had uh, another phrase I wasn't familiar with. In the past, we have had a responsible and responsive fiscal stewardship. I'm not, I, I know what those two words mean. I don't know what those mean to you in terms of what that, how that, how they characterize our fiscal stewardship. So I think the fact that um, CA, uh, you know, I can't speak to 55 years, but sure. at least in recent history, based on all of the budgets I have seen and the financial performance, have consistently met or beat budget. Um, so I think that would be the responsible piece. Responsive would be that there have continued to be uh, both repair and maintenance to ensure that we're delivering what uh, the community investments that are shared resources, as well as identifying critical capital projects and implementing those based on our mission and values that the board has approved. Great, thank you. That helps me understand those. Mm -hmm. Moving to the, I think it's the next one, um, which is the one we used the word creative approaches. Was that the first one? Or? It's in the first in one. In the first one, yeah, mm -hmm. um, still there. Uh, I have to admit I'm of two minds around this kind of, of a process. You know, people will say that if it's if you can't measure it, it's not worth putting in a goal. On the other hand, there are people who will say, if you can measure it, it's so trivial that it's not really a, a goal. Mm -hmm. And so when you say things like, so on the one hand, I like, okay, I want, right, great, implement creative approaches to address those challenges, that'd be wonderful. But it strikes me that on the other hand, you could have done great create creativity and done great create, create wonderfully creative approaches which failed to address the challenges. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm wondering, as and this, this would be an example, and I think it fits with some other goals, as you think of us evaluating you around these things, how do you want us, what's your perspective on how you want us to be approaching that conundrum? You know, like, great, she did 15 creative things and they all flopped, she wins. <laughs> or she did 15 creative things, they all flopped, that's a loss. I, or, you know, to put it, to put it baldly, what, what would your thoughts be, guidance for us be? Uh, I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not really clear on the evaluation process right now. I mean, there is one in the policy book dated in 2017 that describes the president CEO evaluation process. Um, I have one in my contract, uh, and then there was one that was developed by the FY22 board, and um, I just recently received a performance evaluation, and none of those three processes were followed. So 
I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not quite sure how the board takes the goals and objectives. I can speak from my side, yeah, and my side is that the the critical piece in my mind, very similar to your point, is that we can set, you know, very specific targeted goals, and certainly if that's what this body wants to do. Um, I think that the adaptation and the ability to um, be much more strategic in constantly changing circumstances that, as I think we all know, are always present, but are especially present right now. Mm -hmm. um, my response would be when I do my self-evaluation, which I was asked to do this past year, and I did a mid-year report out and a year-end report out, that it is on me to provide concrete examples of how I think I achieved that goal. And those concrete examples, to your point, I can't tell you right now whether it would be three examples or whether it would be 15. So I, I think I'm less metric driven and more if I brought forward three and said two failed, but we learned this and that's why this third one was really impactful. I think it's more so on me to make sure that the outcomes and results are obvious to you know the governing body. Great, thank you. I, uh, three or four, yeah, I'd like to get some other members involved in the discussion if sure. possible. I'll come back to, no, I'll come back to you. Uh, Brian? Yeah, yes, on the part that you mentioned where it says expand connections with community stakeholders and organizations, both long established and those not his, uh, historically engaged. What, what does it actually mean? How does an organization get engaged? What are the, the sort of guidelines for that? So they, they feel that are being heard. Uh, so these are my goals and objectives. So I can't speak to if, if there's a specific organization that you're talking about. When I say expand connections, the way that I do that on the operational side as president CEO, um, I do some direct contact with the organizations, but my role is largely directing my senior team and them directing their team members to uh, identify organizations we have not connected to to respond to organizations that have contacted us, um, to identify uh, through commi external committee work and boards that our staff serve on that bring that back and say, this is an organization that is important to us. So I think, you know, I can only answer it from my role and, and how I operationalize it. So if an organization wants to connect to mm -hmm. you, what is there a process that you go through? Is there something, uh, a certain, leader of that? How, how do that, they connect? Because that... So, so we're talking about my goals and objectives, right. and you're asking me how an organization contacts CA? Well, it's just because I, 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 I understand it's, fr it's from your perspective, but that still means if you're, re if you're reaching out to community, how do they know to make that connect? You know, how, how do they connect? Well, I think you're asking an operational question. I would have to count the number of emails that we receive, and that would be across a multitude of team members. We just inventoried um, our new community engagement manager, and she's still in process. She's about a month in and has, uh, at the last update meeting I had with her this week, we have 452 touches with organizations across Howard County. So I don't know if you're asking a specific question, the answer is organizations contact us in a multitude of ways, sometimes staff because they're working in wellness. Sometimes our open space team reaches out to them and says, hey, can we partner on this? It's, it's through a variety of ways. Thank you. Any, any further questions? Bill. Yep. Going through this, I haven't seen membership discussed at all. And I was wondering if membership is part of the president's goals for the year. And, uh, for me, it's one of our crucial points. We need to certainly increase membership, and it's it's not included. It's it's absent from this evaluation. I was wondering your thoughts on that. So um, I, I would say it's not absent. To achieve the FY23 budgeted goals, there's an 11 percent increase in membership that is in that budget. Well, why not just say exceed 11 percent increase in membership as a goal then? Because I'm saying that we're going to achieve the FY23 budget, which has a multitude of financial goals in it. Well, why not put them in here then? I mean, it, this is all done through euphemism. I, I'm implying that I'm going to make 11% or better than 11% because it's said in another document. 
there's no footnote, there's no reference. It's, it just says a bunch of words here, right, that, that don't say membership. Is that correct? I, well, I don't believe what you're characterizing is correct. When it says FY23 budgeted goals, I, I believe that represents the adopted FY23 budget, which is a very comprehensive document. Sure. That if you want to understand what those budgeted goals are, you would reference the budget. So but, I mean, if, if you want something specific in here, I mean, it certainly can be included, but I guess I'm saying I, I think we're actually, I'm reaching for more than a singular bullet of 11% membership. There's a lot of components that's in the FY23 budget. So I, I, don't, I don't agree with the characterization that it's just words on a paper. Um, I mean, in, in my opinion. Uh, one, one clarification, when you say membership, are you talking numbers or dollars? Uh, it could be either. I mean, it, you know, uh, it, I guess it's how is it stated in the budget, if that's the, the, the context that we're using here for this. Um, how is that stated in the well, budget? And, and budgets are usually dollars, although there is a, right. uh, there, there's a, a component or an appendix at the end which will talk about uh, numbers. Um, it's, you know, it could be an either or. You know, that, that, there is certainly something that could be said for that. You know, it's a loan percent in dollars or 15% in numbers. It's, it's a, probably about the same, um, roughly speaking. Um, but it, I just figured that we would have that stated explicitly. Implicitly is, is something to chew on. Andy? Yeah, um, I, mean, I think you've got a lot of um, good ideas, good goals. Um, I think my biggest concern is, um, as you kind of started out, we we're living in a very different year. Um, and although you may have greatest intentions, and um, you, you simply may get swamped, simply trying to manage what is about to occur, what is occurring and what is going to continue to occur in terms of the financial. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and so part of me worries a little bit that if we set all these goals <clears throat> and suddenly some of them aren't achievable, not because you can't achieve them, mm -hmm. but because we got to spend all our time figuring out how to handle the economic situation. Um, yeah, I don't want that to reflect badly, and I don't know how to incorporate that in, but it's just uh, something I think that the board has to consider um, that, you know, we can set goals, but it may be that they get overtaken <clears throat> by something that is much more important in terms of, um, you know, the economy or something driving us that, that um, yeah, we don't necessarily like it, but we're kind of going to be stuck with it. You have any comments? I, I would say I concur, I, which is why it's in the beginning. I mean, I, I think that that's why I wanted to clearly state, I think achieving our adopted budget uh, is a much bigger mountain to climb given what has only already happened in just the first month of the fiscal year. So I, I would concur and would certainly hope that the evaluation would take into consideration, you know, global issues <laughs> that impact everyone, yeah. Jenny? Yeah, uh, I'm sure this is in here someplace, but uh, we talk about uh, relations with uh, village boards and community stakeholders, other organizations. Is there anything in here about relationships with the board, corporate board, or it's got to be in here someplace, I'm sure. Well, that had been included as, um, a section in the evaluation, at least the format that I was given last year, so I did not call it out as a separate standalone goal. Uh, I don't understand. Uh, is it one of the goals under something else, or is it uh, I, I just, so it's I'll, not here at all? I'll say it again. It was in my performance evaluation and in my contract, it's one of the components that I'm evaluated on. So I didn't think that I needed to put it forward as an explicit goal and objective given that it is part of my operational duties. Okay. Any further questions? Uh, Alan's got his hand up. 
Yeah, I was wondering if anybody else wanted to jump in before I go around a second rep time. Yeah. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I guess I want to follow up on what Ginny just asked about, in addition to a couple of other small questions and points I want to make. It seems to me that everything just about that you have in these goals is part of your job responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so if board relationships is specifically called out in your contract as something you're to be evaluated on, my experience is what we ask the president to do is come up with goals so that we can agree on them and then or, mm -hmm. you know, help modify, agree on them ultimately so then we know what to evaluate. If there's no goal around, for example, board relationship, mm -hmm. then we're left just to our own devices. And if that's how you want it, that's that's a way to go. Um, a specific question I had, when, when you started talking about the management contract, you started to say village boards and then you switched and you said village managers. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to, I, I should know this, but because I don't have a vote on my village board, I, I don't, sometimes don't remember. Do village boards approve the management contract or is it the village managers that approve the management contract? So the, so the village boards approve them, but the work teams are the village, village managers. managers. So it, right. to get the work done, it's the, it's the managers, managers, right. But ultimately it's the, the village boards need to be involved. Right. Um, there are three things that, or two things that I'd like, I would like to see subtle changes in. When you talk about engagement in the planning process, which I think is great, um, we have a, at least unless it's been changed since I was previously on the board, uh, we have a strategic goal around advocacy, which to me is a stronger word than engagement. And so I would, you know, as an individual board member, I would like to see advocacy reflected in the goals, advocacy for, and then advocacy about what, of course, is the next question. Um, you talk about interactive sessions around important community topics, and I'm just wondering, in, as you think about those, as you wrote that and envisioned that, is that a staff thing? Is that a president thing? Is that a board thing? Who, who's, and, and well, let me just make the statement. I think we as a board need to be more involved in that. I would, I would prefer to see those as not every single, every single engagement, but that we as a board need to be doing more interactive sessions as we have done sometimes in the past. But so I would prefer to see it as an inclusive thing. Uh, did you want me to respond to any of your comments? Or? Well, it's, if, if you have. Well, I was just gonna go yeah, back sure. to the one that um, sure. your comment to follow up on Jenny. I, I do wanna say that I did not have an explicit goal last year that called out the board relations. Um, again, it was in my evaluation. So I uh, didn't have any comment last year that, that that was a challenge. So certainly if this board wants it included, that, that certainly can happen. And then I was just gonna clarify your question. We have started those interactive sessions. We've been doing them over the past year. So we've done them on COVID, we did them on the budget. We did, as you just described, a candidate forum and had board participation. We did one on stream restoration. And that is um, not uh, specific to me. That's really uh, part of the goal there is to get our technical staff um, and better access to the community. And those were interactive sessions that had, uh, you know, many attendees and we answered questions, you know, in real time, so. I guess, I guess my, my, my mm -hmm. point was who the we is. Is the we staff, is the we staff and board? You envision those or have experienced those. And my preference would be that it be at least some combination that the we is inclusive of board and staff. Uh, and the last thing, I, I love your point about purposeful use of data, and I guess I just want to put in a plug that my experience has been in the past, specifically around financial data, that we've been told, and I, I may get the words slightly wrong, that, that CA doesn't look at, for example, the, you know, we would ask things like, does Hobbit's Glen Golf Course make money or lose money? and we get told we don't look at programs that way. Uh, at, you know, the sort of singling them out in that way. 
uh, or do, does sports and fitness make money or lose money? You know, and I guess I would like to put in a plug, this is me as an individual board member talking, that that kind of data would be very useful because for me, the one of the guiding questions that we as a board need to be always monitoring and, and thinking about is what, what ought all residents, i.e. through the assessment, be paying for and what ought the users of services to pay for and how do we make those judgments and decisions and when we don't know some of that financial performance data, it's hard to, to evaluate, to know how much the community is paying for something that might, we might think ought to be paid for by users. So, so we did that in the FY22 budget process in, in great detail great. by Thank department you. and Thank it's you. recorded. So we, uh, unless this board changes the process, I would certainly expect that we would be reporting that kind of data in the next budget process. Great. Any, any further questions, Sherry? Yeah, um, um, will you say expand the use of collaborative and cross-functional programs and work groups? So I know that you've, that you've done, that you've introduced a lot of that into the organization. Do you see this as being um, a continuation of that? In other words, getting more staff um, to be working on maybe things that are a little outside of their comfort zone, but expanding into other areas in, in the organization so that people are cross-training. Was that what you were? Yes, yes. So it would continue what exists now, you know, which is, you know, it's a quick cross-section of events and outreach as well as encroachments. I mean, it's a wide variety. And then um, expanding to other topic areas and or to your point, um, the departments perhaps or the teams that are involved. Because as we've done that, we've realized, oh wait, we have a blind spot there, we need to pull somebody in. We're really focused on how early in the process as you start to either ideate something or assess something, are all of the um, minds, but also just the idea of, you know, another set of eyes involved early so that it doesn't go down a long chain and then have to start back over again. Yeah, so, all right, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. And, and as part of that, um, have you developed or thought about developing sort of a leadership ladder Mm -hmm. That as people expand their their uh, their skills and talents and abilities, um, that there is an incentive to um, to future um, leadership for them, and that really can take place from all over the the organization. Mm -hmm. So um, I just throw that out there because I think that would be an important thing um, to see in terms of staffing mm -hmm. um, as we're coming out of this post COVID mm -hmm. period. Um, I, I think that's a great point. I, I believe that we are, have been putting a lot of that in place, um, particularly in community programs and services as well as community operations when I reference the team structures and the positions. Um, part of that actually emerged also when we did our wage compression analysis this past year as we were doing the budget and Howard County changed the minimum wage legislation. Um, so I think those component pieces have fed into making sure the positions align where people have an ability to advance. And then on the flip side, um, on the senior team, we've really been talking more about succession planning and making sure that we're identifying people and or identifying skill gaps. That, that perhaps people need to work on. So I'd, I'd also just want to suggest that that some um, follow-up memos about some of this would be really helpful to the board, because I know that you're into the details, mm -hmm. but at the board level, we really don't get to see too much of this, but that's a very important um, part of the goal of building up the organization again. So that would be great. And any further questions? I actually just have one question. Um, on on your second page, you say reestablish CA of the Progressive Community Organization, and that implies to me that we were at one point a progressive community organization, and we're no longer a progressive community organization. So my question is, how do you currently uh, classify a CA, and what exactly is meant by getting to being a progressive community organization? Hmm. So I think that's more reflective of what I have heard very consistently out in the community. So um, I hear that term a lot, 
we were founded, we were very progressive. Um, this community was that. CA is supposed to be the steward of that vision. And CA had um, become very insular, is the characterization I hear a lot, as well as disconnected from the community. So when I think of the word progressive, what I mean by that is that we are doing things um, in service delivery to community, in engaging community, in uh, connecting community that is a best practice and is getting attention for being a place people want to be, is how I characterize it. So, so, so to basically rephrase it, basically trying to improve communications with the, commu with the community again. No, I, I think it goes back to a couple points that have been made, right? Advocacy, what we are um, putting forward as what our values are. Um, so definitely effectively communicating that when we do it. Yes. Okay, thanks. Dick? There's a word for that, and that's branding. We need to improve our brand and our perception, consumer perception of our brand. Of course, that implies we don't have to improve the brand just to improve the consumer's perception. Well, I think we're doing a lot of wonderful things, but people aren't seeing it. I, I believe we're addressing that. I mean, on a regular basis, uh, you know, the monthly well, president's I'm, I'm report. Not, I, I think we are. Okay. Uh, no, I was. He, he pointed. I didn't. Yeah, I, yeah. I was just. I, I, I believe just, we're striving for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to yeah, follow up on that. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a concern of mine that mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, people think we're just in the gym business or something, selling memberships, and uh, uh, there's a lot more to us than that. We are upholding the Rouse vision mm -hmm. and legend, and people don't see that, and that's. That's a branding issue. And so it's always a good idea to periodically re-examine what that brand should be and what that message should be. Good point. That's what's oh. on the wall right now. Probably against my own best advice in my internal head here, I gotta say something. It's it's far more than branding, it's actually doing. This community used to be a disruptor. It used to be a place where things were leading edge. And for a lot of, of the last few years, there's been a lot of defending of the status quo rather than setting and putting ourselves out there to be a progressive community. It's much more than branding, it's doing. I'm gonna stop talking now because I'm probably gonna get in trouble, so I'll just go there. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that's how you support the brand, by doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's hard to have a brand doing nothing. Yeah. Ellen? I'll just uh, agree with what, what Bill just said that um, other specific point I was gonna make in response to what you said, Dick, but your your passion outweighed. It's gonna get me to all stuff. <laughs> and, and, I, I liked it. Anyway, I think we're uh, well over time for this for this segment, but uh, certainly if you have any ideas going going forward, please email, email them to uh, uh, me and uh, Leggy. Uh, the next on our list is the draft ethics policy discussion. So everyone uh, has the uh, draft ethics policy in front of them. It's, it's in your board packet. This has been something that was discussed by the previous board, and now it comes to this board to, to discuss and, and work through this policy. So uh, given that, uh, do we have any questions or comments regarding the, the uh, draft ethics policy? Dick? Well, it's my understanding that you're uh, looking for volunteers to on a committee to review uh, all our policies, including our ethics policies, and maybe that's what we need to discuss. Duly noted. Are there, questions are there, are there any questions on the, the policy first? I, I didn't see anything radically different. In the, it's a lot of it with fairly uh, grammatical changes. Uh, in it. Unless I was missing something. Thank you. So I, I can provide context. I, I'm happy to do that. We started this process um, internally uh, in January and delivered a memo to the CA board on February 18th outlining the uh, 
kind of timeline that we were in and that the general counsel, uh, human resources and audit were um, evaluating the policies and were looking at best practices in terms of um, governance, uh, legal requirements, external requirements such as insurance as well as um, what is written in our charter and bylaws. That process um, went through an iteration that was delivered March 31st to the board and we took four separate documents that in some cases had redundancies, in some cases had language that um, now lived in other policies and put them into one place. And that was provided to the board on March 31st. Um, I sent a very lengthy outline of how the process had occurred and then what was planned going forward. It was on two board agendas uh, because it did uh, need the two meeting reading rule. Um, so prior to our first board meeting, after we provided it two full weeks in advance, um, on April 14th, there were was one board member that sent comments and at that 14th work session, there was not substantive issues that created significant changes, which is actually the track changes that you have in your packet tonight. So that was posted on April 22nd. Um, there was uh, an email sent on April 23rd by the board chair indicating a desire to uh, have this up for vote on April 28th because there had not been significant comments and identifying the need of um, being able to report out that we had made progress on that uh, around our governance um, and some requests that had come during our insurance renewal process as well as our external audit process. On April 27th, one board member sent comments and on April 28th, um, the motion to approve uh, failed and it was indicated at that time that significant more discussion needed to happen. The chair uh, that night sent out a Google sheet for um, additional comments to be included. Four have been input since uh, April 28th and you have the current version in front of you. So staff is at a point where we put in significant resources for approximately three months, uh, you know, with our experts, uh, again, general counsel, HR and audit and um, put this forward. And we really just need the board to either approve it as is or discuss in a meeting what the changes are and, um, that is where we are just for a reference since it seemed to be a question, so. I guess to help the, the newer members get up to speed, um, mm -hmm. are there any significant changes from this version versus the version that the that this board signed? Like significant policy changes or additions or subtractions between, the, between what we signed on this board and what's in the, uh, the new policy document? The ethics policies that were signed by this board are yep. the current policies, yes. which is a four separate policies. So yeah, there, I mean, it's quite different than the version, I, the revised version that we have now, if that's your question. I no, 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 I'm, I'm not talking about the format. I'm talking about uh, are there any new policies or are there any deleted policies or are there any provisions, yeah. provisions that, that substantially changed? In I'm not this, talking about the format, yeah. but I'm talking about was there anything added? Is there anything so, removed yes. from what we signed? Yes, um, in, the, in the detail that we sent, um, there's over 20 bullet points where we highlighted what the changes were. What we were asked at the BOC to provide for this meeting was that the board was going to discuss it. So we provided the, the current, where it stands today because we're waiting on direction from the board. Um, you know, we put forward the revisions that we're recommending based on governance, legal, human resources, and audit um, requirements and best practices. So we're waiting on the board to either say, yes, what we have is great, or have further discussion about what the substantive issues are. Dick? Okay. Um, <clears throat> As you will recall, 
uh, back when this process started, it was suggested that before Wes jump into this thing, that the board simply state what our problems were with the current uh, ethics policies. And there were a number of things. And we also suggested that staff uh, provide us with some background on what is legally required, what best practices are, et cetera. And that was ignored. And instead, Wes went and attacked the uh, old, or actually the current ethics policy, and I think did a very good job of condensing it and uh, making a, you know, taking it and, and really cleaning it up a great deal. The problem is uh, there is still a lot more to do because the board had never really discussed what our overall objectives were. And they were things like, it shouldn't be 27 pages long. We're all members of other boards and uh, ethics documents are five pages at the most, um, sometimes less. Uh, there was a great deal of redundancy uh, in this. Uh, it covers a lot more than just the board. There are a lot of things. And the problem is that 10 people cannot write something. Uh, it's just 10 people trying to, trying to wordsmith and edit, and it just, it just doesn't happen. And what's been suggested is to have a small committee <coughs> put together a clean, fresh document that can be presented to staff and to the board for comments. Uh, but it, and I think we can do that. We, at the same time, we are trying to make some sense out of the policy book, which is all organized by year instead of by subject. There's a lot of things that can be done that we shouldn't be wasting the board's time wordsmithing a document. It's just, you know, it's just, you got to look at these things holistically and it's best done by a small number of people or one or two people at the most. And then presented uh, as, as a complete document. And as I said, I think Wes did a very good head start on it, but really needs a lot of fine tuning. Are you willing to volunteer on the on I have, I have had my hand up for that for months now. And I actually wrote a good piece of the old one to clean up a previous document that was even worse. Thank you. Um, I, I was just gonna say, in, in my experience, and as we worked on this internally as, as senior staff, um, you uh, have things like ethics policies written by your attorney and your uh, human resources expert, and in this case, we have audit, so we brought her in as well, um, and not um, the actual board members or you know what I would characterize as as uh, you know. Obviously, there's a wide variety of expertise on this board, but we do not have any attorneys. Um, we do not have any directors of HR. Uh, we don't have any auditors. Um, so I think that I, I just would caution that there are external requirements at, from everything from when we do any kind of um, lending practice. We have to represent what's included in our ethics policies and that we abide by it. Um, what is, as I mentioned in our governance, some of the regulations that are, are state and national given our organization. So the board member input, I agree, having 10 people wordsmith a document would not remotely be a good use of the board's time. What we were looking for is the substantive, let's strengthen this section or let's change this procedure. And that's um, with the exception of the, the meeting on April 14th where there were a couple of things brought up that were not significant, we were able to quickly change, that has not come back to staff. No, it, ha kind of it hasn't pieces. because uh, we were kind of waiting to, you know, with the new board to uh, get working on this. And obviously anything that this committee would write would be reviewed by mm -hmm. staff. Wes would, we would certainly want Wes to look at it. Mm -hmm. We would certainly want Jackie and, and uh, to look at it. Uh, 
and, and you, Lakey, we'd certainly want you to weigh in too. But I think what we need to do is take this a couple steps further before we uh, have a final vote on it. And the fastest way to get this done, and I want to do it as quickly as possible, would be to have a small, a small group work on it. Alan? Yeah, I can, I can certainly support that. Um, I'd also just like to extend Eric's question. If I understood your question, Eric, you asked what were the changes from the current policy to this, and I think the answer was many. And so I guess I'd like to hear from staff's point of view, without getting too hung up, too hung up on the term most, what are the five or so most significant changes besides the format and besides turning it from four documents into one, and I hear re reducing redundancies, but changes in how ethics were done under the current policy compared to how ethics are done under uh, this proposed policy, what are some of the significant changes as you see them? Because it's hard to, I mean, I appreciate track changes, but on a PDF format, it, you can't turn off the track changes. It's just really hard to read. So what I can do is, I mean, it's over 20 bullet points. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to characterize what was significant and not, but um, I'm happy say, to could, send this total. Could you I mean, say more I about can, why that wouldn't be appropriate? I mean, so I'm asking for your professional opinion on this or yours or Wes's or whoever's. Because I'm gonna be honest, I was told at the board operations committee that this was gonna be a board discussion and staff had no role in it, that the board was gonna discuss how they wanted to discuss it. That may be, but the Board Operations Committee does not speak for the whole board. The Board Operations Committee sets the agenda, so. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the ways to break through this kind of impasse that we're at is to have this go to a small board committee that can cut through um, what some of those basic issues are and make recommendations to the full board. Um, I, I, I think that's really at this point, um, I think that's the most effective yeah. thing that we can do, do to move this forward. Um, there are procedural um, issues. Um, I have copies of the ethics policy going back to 2008. Mm -hmm. And the procedures that are embedded are very different. So, you know, trying to get this stuff together and clean it up, both from the perspective of how it looks and, and what the language sounds like so people can understand, especially those people who are coming on the board for the first time. Um, and in terms of, of setting out a procedure that people can agree on, because there were quite a number of procedural changes, let's just send it to a small committee and have them come back with recommendations. So I agree with Dick on that. So, so, so one thing I noticed on the agenda, we also have a board policy uh, compilation discussion, which comes next, which I'm also guessing is gonna involve a small committee. So the question I have is, should that be the same committee or a different committee? It has to be the same. I mean, I don't think it makes any difference. I think the, the, the problem is that we need to focus on a, on a particular outcome that we want that the board wants as well. Andy? Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm, <clears throat> I'm actually hearing very different things. Um, Dick wants us to write a policy. Okay, that's what he's, he's, talk, he's been talking about. Sherry, I, and I kind of like more what Sherry is saying, is that, look, the focus should be on what is it that the board wants, but not write the policy. You, 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 I mean, there are certain issues, certain procedures you can say, well, should we do X or should we do Y? Um, <clears throat> and then you take that and then you bring that back. Um, but you let staff draft the actual policy because we do not have the experience and the other thing you have to think too is this isn't just the board, okay? and, that, and that's the part of the problem. I mean, this is for the entire organization, okay? This policy does not just simply apply to the board. This is the entire policy for everybody in the organization. And although we may have a focus 
on, let's say, the, the board part of it, it, it affects staff, it affects the team members, and we absolutely don't have that kind of expertise. And what I think we need to do is focus more on, I'll say, some of the major issues and figure out, but let the professionals write the policy. Dick? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I am a professional. And I have written things like this. And you and I have yeah, worked together. I, I know, on, on but you're not a lawyer. And I, as I said, whatever, the, whatever this committee would put together would go to West for review. I'm talking about style and, and the, the way it's done. And as far as it's being for the entire organization, no. There is a, when we started out, this, this was we had one for the entire organization. We had one for senior staff. We had one for senior staff and the board. We had something from the board. And Wes did do a very good job of tying those all together. What we're talking about right now is an ethical policy for the board that is specific to the board. And uh, I'm not going to get into ethic policies for the whole organization. That's an HR problem as far as I'm concerned. Bill? And I, two quick items. First of all, I, I, I think as far as the entire organization is concerned, I really think that that ought to be handled through the audit committee, and they should uh, take input from the, the folks in audit, and then take a look at it, and then send it to the board for an up or down vote for the rest of the, the, the company. It should be written through audit. Um, the board there should review it and then bring it up here. There's some people with real expertise there. Um, my two cents on that. Second, th and then the rest of the policy should be written for directors and officers, and that should be handled by professionals, and then the board should be dealing with that itself, the, the, uh, this body. Um, that being said, I think we're at a point right now where we either have to state what our inputs are for what this policy should be, or we should state what the final product should look like. You can't do both on this. I'm hearing both sides of that. We either need to clearly state what the input should be and then allow it to be written, or we should say this is what it should look like at the end and then have it be, grow into that. Jenny? Yeah. Um, it's, at least from a few people, it sounds like what I'm hearing is this board should simply be writing a, a ethics policy for this board. No, please don't. I, I didn't say that we should be writing it. No, no, no. I, I, th this, whatever we do, should really only uh, impact th the CA Board of Directors, and we will just only re deal with that. Is that what I'm hearing? I think I'm hearing from some it's people. Not what I said. Jenna? Oh. Shouldn't we be held to the same ethical standards as the organization? I mean, I'm confused why they would differ. They're... Fairly because I rule different. Well, it'd be briefer for one. Oh. Bill and Dick. Bill, Bill and oh, Dick. Okay, if I could just answer that, I think that yes, what what the rest of the organization is held to as far as ethics, board members should also be. But we have things like duty of care, duty of loyalty, that are not necessarily explicit and under the same terms or somebody who's working a counter, well, right? That, that's all I'm saying is that's what the difference is, is we're a plus, we're not, you know what I'm saying? Does that help? Janet? No, okay. doesn't matter. Could I ask Could a Dick? clarification question on what Bill said? Sure. So, so Bill, what you're saying is, I mean, make sure I hear or do right, is it should be an ethics policy for the entire organization that applies to everybody. And then there should be a separate one which covers these other circumstances that occur with the board of directors, but everybody in the board of directors should still be subject to the organizational policy. I mean, so, so in essence, you're looking at like a policy for the organization and then a supplement for the board of directors. Is that? Isn't that what this is? Yeah, that's it has pretty much what this is. Board of directors, hey, this one. senior yeah. management board of directors, so. ethics policy. Well, I mean, it's pretty I was just trying to get out. clarification if that's what Bill was. What's uh, kind Dick, of Sherry? Well, uh, I, Dick, Dick I and Sherry. I would certainly think that there are certain basic ethical considerations, and for the entire organization, including the board, there are specific things that relate 
only to the board and I think there could be a nice tight little document and in fact uh, I just uh, signed one for uh, my term on the Inner Arbor Trust which is seven pages long and why we need 27 pages half of what's in that policy is policy it's not ethics it's policy it's how you report something what happens when it's reported who does what with that that's policy that go that should go in the policy book. the ethics piece is about how we should behave and that's one distinction i'd like to make um, and traditionally there have been different policies for different groups and that's why we had all that's why we have all the redundancy in the policies that we all signed a month ago Andy, to answer your question, it's, they're very similar things, but for instance, there's stuff in here in the, the ethics policy that applies to everybody. It says if you're not sure what to expense, you can always contact the HR director. And I'm probably not gonna contact the HR director and contact the board chair and the president, um, which are also listed. But it, it's, uh, you know, there should be a little bit something written for staff so that they understand what it is and it's not confused with what the board does and something written for the board. That's what I'm saying. They could be similar in very, in certain areas. Ms. Sherry? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think there is a difference between a board of directors and the employees of an organization who are doing operational things. Right. The, the board of directors does not do operational stuff. We don't handle money. We don't do hiring. Uh, we we don't do supervision of employees. I mean, there's 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 a very different set of roles and responsibilities. And so I think the section that pertains to the board of directors addresses what the board of directors does, and the other things are about the operations that are internal to the organization. So um, th that's why I think that that's, those are the outcomes um, and, and the values that we're expressing. Um, that's what we should be focused on. Jenny? Yeah, on, unless there's a, a lot more discussion, I would like to suggest that we um, move this, uh, the ethics policy into the policy committee and just policy procedures and ethics committee. Um, and anybody that wants to contribute to it, uh, we need to start that process right away. So I'd like to move that, see what happens. Are there any, are there any objections to that? We're yeah, I object to that, but yeah, we, I don't we, don't do votes. we don't do votes. Well, I'd like to suggest that. Yeah, okay. there, but uh, we want to do the thumbs up, thumbs down. But uh, yeah, can you get a show of hands? Of well, if I just have. I just want to make sure I'm clear on the. Is current. So part of what you're suggesting is that this not come up for a vote at the June. Mm -hmm. meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I make sure we're clear mm -hmm. on that. That's I believe it's not even on the June agenda. Okay. So this is not scheduled to come up for a vote until July, the end of July. Yeah, yeah. What, what I'm saying is we do have a lot of new members and I think they really need to understand uh, what's happening. And I think what, what we're hearing uh, is yes, we should separate and have a board of directors thing and we should have, you know, separate. I'm hearing from some people, no, you shouldn't do that. So I think these are issues that we have to resolve. So I'd like to uh, move that it go into the committee and certainly every board member can go to the board committee, have a say. Also staff, we're going to need to be working closely with staff. I think we've all agreed to that. Uh, but we also need to get some draft we can get back to the board and see if those concepts are even something they agree to before we take a lot of staff time in terms of making it a legal document. Is just my suggestions, so, so, so that we can move on. Because yeah, I think so. we pretty well discussed this. Uh, yeah, so um, I do want to move on from this. I'll, I'll let you get the final. Can I just clarify one thing before yeah. you make a motion? Um, uh, no motion. There's no, no motion. Uh, There's no motion on the table. It's an idea. I no motion. Before your suggestion, perhaps moves to something that is on the next agenda for a vote. I just wanted to put forward that um, as. Uh, 
returning board members know and, and new board members, I'll just make a general statement. Having a timeline around this is really important. So just this idea of merging the this into looking at all the policies, I would just ask that if that is what this board does, that the ethics policy is put as the number one priority mm -hmm. with as much time sensitivity as possible because this revision process is something that, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we've reported out on insurance, we've reported out to the audit committee, and we've reported out to the external auditor. And so I think that it's important that it doesn't, you know, we thought we were on track. It did, you know, the motion failed on April 28th, and we literally have had nothing to report since then. Sure. So I think just the idea that we had indicated it was being revised, that's all we indicated, and that we had a schedule for it, we have to have the ability to, to say we're expecting a revised policy at X time. Yes, so, uh, agreed. Yeah. This should definitely be the number one yeah. priority. Um, can I get a show of hands uh, supporting moving this to committee? So, I, sounds like we've got a majority there. I do have a question. One last question. Is, the, uh, is our current policy or policies that are in effect right now, are they deficient in any way as far as our lenders are concerned or anything like that? So, I mean, if by chance we couldn't come up with something and they were in effect next May, would that be problematic for our lenders? Yes, yeah, some of our um, policies were problematic in our, uh, so I can't speak to lenders because we don't have anything outstanding currently, but uh, they were problematic for both our insurance renewal when we went through it and also um, our external audit. And so when I asked what are the significant changes, are there changes that you all are proposing that would help strengthen that, and if so, what are they? Or put us in alignment with mm -hmm. the expectations? Let's identify them. I would characterize them generally as strengthening the procedures for ethics um, violations when they happen in, um, and this is from our insurance and our audit. And then also having more clarity around how the enforcement aligns with what is allowed in our charter. Currently, there is something in the ethics policy that is different than what is in our charter. Mm -hmm. um, so those were the kinds of, um, I don't want to quite call them conflicts, but those areas of difference were concerning so to the, our insurance as well as our auditors. So does this current revision, proposed revision, uh, now align with the charter? We believe it does. And could you point, is there like one place or like is there more? Can, 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 I, that's you, what I was going to yeah, say. Can you, I mean, if it I'll points send those things out. Yeah, yeah, I can just yes. resend out the email so everybody's yes. on the same page. Thanks. More than 20 bullets. Is yes, because um, yep. we don't have time to go through all 20 bullets. Um, so, so, yeah. I'd, uh, I'd also like to ask the committee to not only prioritize the ethics discussion, but also work closely with staff to uh, to bring it to fruition. Okay. Um, next on our agenda is the board. Expedited. Yes, expedited. Okay. Next on our, ad our agenda is the board policy compilation discussion. So everybody should have a copy of the board of directors policies. Um, if everybody doesn't have a copy, please let myself and, and Lake you know it. We will make sure you get a copy. Um, the, the current policy book is organized by year, and there's been uh, um, some talk about trying to update the, uh, the policy book and, and look for ways to improve it and also look for any uh, possible contradictions. Um, are there any discussions about uh, this topic, Dick? Well, I would suggest the first thing we do is go through them not by year, but by subject matter and get all the ones that treat the same subject uh, together. And then we're going to have to look for redundancies and contradictions and point those out because then the board has to decide what the actual policies are going to be. Uh, and we would end up with you know, a vote on various policies wherever there are contradictions. Any other comments? I have a question. Quick question. Um, in the past, 
several years in the past. Uh, one could go to the website and click on board of directors or whatever leadership and and one and there was like a it was almost random order listing of policies that got taken down at maybe two two website revisions ago is the policy book as it stands now either in whole or in the various pieces is that information available online or is it only available um, in that book uh, so it is not currently on the website, um, particularly okay. since these are board-related policies. This is all available electronically on the shared drive as I've sent out email um, but not indicating, to okay. not to the public because okay. they are board-related policies. That is not, is not inventoried on our website right now for the reasons that have been indicated. Um, frankly, there are many that are contradictory and um, I think it could be an incredibly ex confusing experience for a member of the public. Okay. Uh, I thought we had a subcommittee that was gonna work through this. Yes. So I'm not clear what we're discussing right now. But I thought the whole point of a yeah. subcommittee was the, the, to take yes. it away the, so the, the board the whole, doesn't discuss whole, it and bring yeah. recommendations. Yes, that, that, that is the point. So we've got, we've got a subcommittee. I do ask the subcommittee to have this secondary to the, the ethics policy. Um, assuming there's no further discussion or direction for the subcommittee. Um, well, I've got a question for staff. Okay. Um, w since the, one of the concerns I'm hearing is that um, the, the book was put together by dates, uh, years, is it possible for the staff to put it together by topic? I mean, why not? Uh, or, or, is, go ahead. Is this, I, mean, I think at this point, there's something that the subcommittee could look into. Um, let, let's yeah, let's 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 uh, let's let the subcommittee to take care of this. Um, we have to decide what the topics. Yeah, are. yeah, that that that's all the role for the subcommittee. Um, so, assuming there's no further discussion on this, um, we'll move on to uh, agenda item F, the Lake Elkhorn uh, uh, wa uh, watershed uh, topic. Um, Brian moved to add this to the agenda, so I'll let him start off. Yes, well, as we heard this evening, there's a number of different issues, and I've got some, I think one of the things, we, you know, we started to have tours, so we're, we're trying to get educated on what's going on with the watershed, and I think we're all at different levels. And, um, and one of the things I, I, I thought was, you saw I responded to Andy, uh, his characterization, there's two parts to it. Um, I, I'd like to really to discuss that. I mean, we had, it's important that we do both parts. You can't do one without the other. I mean, it's, as we've seen, you know, when we get a massive storm, there can be a real big issue if we haven't actually addressed this water in that's actually coming down. So I think what we, the idea of this section was to just get us a, a way forward to, to the next discussion point, but to get make sure that we're all, all done at uh, educational tours and everything else before we bring it back to discuss it in more de yeah. detail. Yeah, we're, we're certainly not going to be able to discuss the environmental details in 15 right. minutes. Okay. I'd also like to thank Dennis for organizing the tours, even though it got uh, stormed out uh, last night. But uh, we, 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 we work with what we can. Um, but I, I think this might be another another instance where a small committee might be able to look at this in more detail because there's a lot of moving parts to this and this is fairly complex. Uh, I just want to say that to date, I have not made up my mind on any of this. I'm really looking for more information. Mm -hmm. I am too. All our, we're getting a lot of contradictory information. And, so it's, I think the education piece of this is, as Brian pointed out, is the critical piece. Yeah, there's, a, there's another point. It's been characterized as for and against. This is not a for and against thing. You know, we're, it's, it's about understanding the problem and fixing the problem. But, but we can't do that until, and understand that until we really get educated. Yeah, it, it's hard to be for or against something when you have like a quarter of the details. Right. Right. And there's a, a t and I've got a ton of details and it's there's a lot there, right. uh, Alan. Well, and I agree with all that, except that at any one decision point, you know, there there, there is an easement we we voted on and, and gave. So do we still are, are there ways to if we choose to to modify that and that would be for or against. So at some point there are votes that that need to happen. The the other piece I would just add is for me that I want to make sure we learn about 
is more about timing because you know some people say something's going to happen the end of the summer other people say this is years away uh, there's th th all those things may be true but I'd want to understand what's happening by the end of the summer and what are the implications of that uh, for us and and the project and then and so on because historically and it's happened over and over again uh, we get in, we meaning the board get informed about an issue only to find out that the decision point is next week and we don't have uh, time to make to really get up to speed be reasonable and rational about it and uh, and make a, a clear decision it's, we heard an example of that tonight in terms of this uh, Lakeview thing so it's we don't have any time to respond if it's decision being made in a week um, on the one hand, we uh, we were in favor of something that's apparently not happening. Do we press it? How do we make a decision about that? We can't do it because we only have a week's notice. It, it definitely being proactive on something that's this time sensitive is, is important. Um, and in, in those lines, having a, a, a small committee look into it and research this and get the timelines right and get all the details and I think is would really help meet that timeline. Um, so I'm sorry. Would like I'd be willing to be part of that. Yes, uh, Sherry? Yeah, um, I, I think the, the first step um, with doing boots on the ground and actually getting a visual was was very, very important. So regardless of the rain, we'll try, we'll try again. <laughs> Definitely um, try it again. I have found it very, very helpful to, to actually go out and, and be in the place that has been worked on, to see the before and after and the middle and, and see it over over time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so so I think that that would be very good for board members who whoever. I would say that uh, that's something that I've been experienced with since the beginning of WAC. I mean, I was there the se second week. So I've been exposed to lots of issues to, to do with this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, and it is also the other thing I was going to say is this is a very complex project. Um, it's a big project. And when I think back to, to some of the stuff that I've done with project management, um, sometimes you have to break it down into smaller pieces. And so that might be something that this committee could take a look at. Are there discrete pieces? So, for example, there's the physical piece, there's the geography, but there's also um, there's a financial piece to this to understand how this plays out over time and the effect on CA and the effect on the community. And that's always a big one when you have these big environmental projects. So that's an educational piece that I think would be very helpful for the board to just keep breaking it down into smaller pieces and then do an analysis around that. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to just make a, a quick general statement that um, we had, you know, by a quick count, over 10 meetings, um, including tours. We've done multiple tours, you know, with previous board members. I know several of you returning did them, as well as the village board, um, as well as residents. And then, you know, we held a special session. I went along with staff to uh, the Long Reach Village Board meeting. So. Certainly continuing that is, is our intention to do outreach. I think the two questions I have, and, and when this was being amended to the agenda tonight, it was mentioned, if there's an expectation for staff to attend a meeting, we really need to know what the key questions are ahead of that meeting uh, in order to be effectively prepared. Um, effectively prepared. Um, I also want to bring up that if this idea of a board subcommittee is being bantied about, I do feel that it's appropriate to remind everyone that we have a watershed advisory committee as well as a climate change and sustainability committee that both are appointed and you have to have qualifications to get on them. And those are exactly board advisory committees and are exactly meant to advise this board. So. I just want to bring up that that would actually be a really good way to use those committees, in, yeah, in my and, opinion. And Robert Monaghan hit some really good points tonight. You know, some things that we hadn't heard of before, and he had some reasons. So that that would be exactly 
what we want to do is to get understand his perspective and, and why and why he says the, he said the things he did. I was going to ask him a question, and I thought, uh, well, it's going to get too involved. So that's part of it, connecting. And I think that committee would then connect to him, and get these que get questions from the board answered, then come back to the board and say these are the questions that are answered. Alan. Yeah, I guess I, I have a question about what are people thinking about this committee? Because it strikes me that there's at least two ways the committee could be chartered. One is to be a small group that comes up with sort of the process. The, this, these, this is, we need to, the board needs to hear from these folks and these folks and these folks, and we need to make these decisions, whether we break it down or what, all those things. But the other possibility is that this small group becomes the experts and hears from this group and that group and that group and forms opinions and then comes to the board with their informed opinion. And I'm wondering, people who are suggesting a small committee, which are we thinking about? I think it's more the former, but being able to, mm -hmm. being able to identify the latter. So being able to do the former, be able to get on top of the timelines, be able to figure out what needs to be done, but being able to identify the latter, figuring out what exports experts that the board needs to hear from when we have to make uh, uh, critical decisions. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, uh, Janine, then Andy. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's, uh, it's the former. It has to do with what the process would be, because I think it's extremely important that the whole board hear uh, or get that information uh, and not hear it secondhand. But I guess I, I really think it's important that the staff be involved with the board in, in establishing who should we hear from, what topics should be covered, uh, you know, what are the key points here. The staff has that expertise, uh, and I would really like to be, have this committee work closely with the staff so that we can do it, you know, come back qu quickly, because I think you have to have this type of, I call it a hearing, uh, within the next couple of weeks. Andy? <clears throat> so I was gonna suggest that one thing we should do is since we're voting next meeting on the charges for the committees is that we add a charge to the watershed committee and the climate advisory committee that they look into this and report back to the board. I mean, at least with their expertise. No, um, no, because, no. because they do have the expertise um, and I certainly would want to hear from them. Um, you know, so, so that's one thing I would suggest. And the second thing I would suggest um, um, is that um, perhaps what it might be good is in the board folder to create like um, the Elkhorn Stream Restoration folder and put the documents that have been set out um, over time so that they're all there and everybody can see them because mm -hmm. some members came on at different times and don't mm -hmm. have access to all those documents. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. So, so I think that way at least it's all there. And mm -hmm. you can, so, so what I would recommend is developing the words um, that you'd want to change and propose it as an amendment to the, uh, the policy, and then we can vote on, okay. vote on that as an amendment. So I'll let you point, point of information, the Watershed Committee has already weighed in in favor of yeah. the stream restoration project. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I suggest that you get them to come present their reasoning okay. behind that. They've already discussed it and evaluated it. Yeah. So it sounds like then we don't even need to Add this to the charge. It's I, I would been done. make the charges uh, amend their charges uh, either committee. I don't think that's at this point appropriate. Sherry? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, time. the staff has done a tremendous amount of work over time and developed all kinds of public materials um, and and has has uh, uh, gone out to to lots of different places in the community. Let's gather that together and put it in one place. Mm -hmm. um, and then our, our newer board members have a place that they can go to. That's that's the resource. Um, you know, this this was why we were always talking about a searchable database because the, the watershed issues go back much further than just this this one issue. There have been other projects as well. So there, there is a continuum here. Um, so at least confine uh, uh, that material that's already been developed. And then I, I think we can, I think the idea of using the advisory boards, having, having people come in to talk about, um, you know, what their backgrounds are and why they think the way they do would also be very useful. But I don't think we need to take up more staff time with this at this point. Okay. 
any further discussion on this? Mm -mm. So can I just, I'm, I'm sorry, can I just recap? So certainly we can get all the documents in one place and, and I'll include in that, we have a stream restoration webpage that has multiple documents and videos of our recorded information session where we answered questions on this project. So I'll, I'll be sure to include that link as well. Um, but at this time, there is nothing further than compiling the documentation that the staff is answering specific questions. I just wanna make sure I'm hearing that correctly. Yes, that's, okay. that's the way I understand it. Thank you. Except the staff is still gonna do the tour. Yes, this, we, we still, we, we still get the tour. We will still do <laughs> we, the tour. We, we still get the tour. <laughs> yes, yes. And again, we had done them and you know, we're like, we need to do and, these again. And I would, I would hope that in all this information, there is some kind of a timeline of decision points that we're hearing decisions are being made at various points. I don't think just know what's being decided when. Well, that's, 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 that's what the committee. That's what the that's what the that's what the that's what the committee needs. That's, that's what the committee needs to map that's out. That's one of the most important questions. That's, that's right? the key thing. Yeah. Just cutting through all the committees and all this, can we just get someone to pick up the phone, call MDE, and say, when do you anticipate to make a decision, or when do you anticipate to get the, these answers back, and what's your timeline? Because that would be a huge help, and we wouldn't all be wondering when the next thing was going to happen. They're the people who are going to make the next step. Can't we just get somebody to call them and get an answer? Is that possible? Well, there, actually, there's several. There, there, there's, several there's, there's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, decisions. yeah, it's, I think it's more complicated than that. MDE sent the 11 page letter. Yes. They're waiting for responses, which will take some time to do. And then after they analyze those answers, they will make the next step. We could make a phone call and find out what the timeline is for that, and that would but provide a Army lot Corps of information. Okay. We haven't heard anything from the Army Corps, as far as I know. I've listened to a lot of people testifying. Nobody said anything about the Army Corps. Staff. Anyway, I think we're actually getting into the details of what the committee should actually be doing. So I would, I would like to, without objection, uh, move on to the questions only uh, uh, phase. Um, we actually have a, Janet. I just wanted to say how great it was that all of the details were included in the um, the definitions around FDP, SDP, the variances, those sorts of things. Um, I think that's really helpful for. Um, context if, if folks aren't familiar with that, as well as the timeline along the um, decision-making piece. I thought that was really helpful as well. Dick? I, I liked it. I thought there's a lot of information in there, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really like the format. What I do miss, though, is that we used to have a lot more information about, you know, other projects. and. I, don't, I actually read that thing all the time to see what's going on, for example, in my village. Uh, there's stuff that's sitting back in the, in the, in the brush that you know, I wanted to know about. But uh, yeah, I really like the new format, very informative. All right. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is the chart, which yeah, I, yeah, the, the, the I, I want to say I've used that for years, and it's been very good because it gives you the heads up what's going on. It, it, no. It's really very so important. So okay. I, why was that removed? It doesn't well, really I, I, I guess I guess the question is, can the chart be added back in? Uh, yeah, we want it back in, yeah. Yeah. So as I indicated previously that when we were working on revamping this, um, this would actually be an example of how we're trying to move into more of an educational resource and advocacy position and not just looking at very specific developments. Um, the answer is frankly um, bandwidth and um, staff resources. So in terms of what we need to allocate resources to, what we have found is that when Jessica Bella, who was at the lead at putting this together, spends time, which she often does, explaining to people how to look things up, they then are empowered to do it. And so the description of how you look up those very specific cases is included in this document. So um, that is something that I think uh, the feedback that we have gotten is that uh, providing the ability to access that information, particularly giving um, that there are uh, a, a wider variety of developments that are going on, um, that that was the way that we were trying to ensure that we're doing um, really smart and responsible resource allocation. So um, again, 
the accessibility of how to get that information is detailed. And, and, and again, I, I really like I, re, I really like the additional information in here and the additional uh, and the formatting because it, it definitely helps you learn more about the process. Brian? Yeah, and one of the things I've been asking, and of course in my emails to you, I've been asking is to make clear what the role of the CA is in development, and it's been hit and miss. So in here, I think it should be very clear what your role is. When do you give comments, like with Lakeview or with um, the other Woodmere? So it's, it's, I think it's really critical that you have something that the process is clear, not just for residents, uh, it's more important for developers or someone that owns a piece of land. They need to know when does the CA get involved because that's been hit and miss. And and then what the process is. That's it. Colin? Yeah, well, I want to sort of add on to that because one way, maybe not, probably not the only way, but one way that CA gets involved is when the board says we want to get involved and we make a, a decision to take a position one way or another on a particular uh, development issue. But the tracker has been helpful to an extent around that, but what's really been helpful is when staff takes an advocacy point of view and informs us and says, hey, this is coming up, this is likely to be something that you are you ought to be concerned about because it, it intersects with, with what you've talked about as your interests in, in Columbia's values and, and upholding the plan community and so on. Uh, and, and that's where just a chart doesn't do it, but something with some, with some commentary can help us. Yeah, and that's one of the other thing is we talk about DPZ and everything. And I, I communicated with you, Lakey, about the fact that DPZ is working with organizations and they've added back in this whole concept that things have to go to the DAP board, which is going to make a big difference. And this is, this is going to make it so that you, we don't have to get quite so involved in this development and it'd be much more proactive. So you don't have staff up to 10, 10 30 or even 11 o'clock at night waiting to give testimony. And any other questions for the questions on the uh, section? Okay, moving on, proposed new topics. <coughs> any proposed new topics? Janet. Are we having a board retreat? Good question. So, Board retreat. We've been, Andy and I have been batting back and forth some ideas, but lacking a, it's, it's hard to know what to plan because we don't know when it's happening or, you know, what the, what are we talking? Are we talking about a day? Are we talking about a half a day? Are we talking about an hour? Are we talking? So it's. So the question I have for. That's been a moving so, target. So you, you, you plan. Let me just say to the, um, to the board, the idea that we're tossing around is basically a three-hour um, dinner discussion, um, you know, during during maybe a weeknight, um, to focus in on what would the you know the board's top priorities, um, and uh, I'll call, I'll call it a a, a pizza party or uh, or mm. so sandwiches or something, you know, where the eleven of us can gather, um, have a little bit to eat, and talk about the activities. Alan, anything you want to? Well, and for me, it's priorities both in terms of what we want to talk about, but also how we want to work with each other. So, and, and the thought is that helps perhaps build some camaraderie yeah. among the board. Exactly. So, so you, you organized the previous retreat, right? No. I didn't? I did not organize the previous retreat. Um, Janet. Oh, Jan organized the previous retreat. Yeah, but I'm not volunteering. I, 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 I was not volunteering anyone. I, I, um, okay, so what, what I'd recommend is if you can uh, email out some potential dates. Out to the board. Send out some potential dates just so we can all uh, um, at least find a common uh, date and time which we can all uh, meet for a retreat and uh, propose a, a general format. All right. Thanks. You want to do that, Alan? Uh, sure. Yeah, just a quick yeah. comment on that. I mean, we town center. I've done a bunch of retreats before at nonprofits, and we had a facilitator. I don't know how formal you want to make this, but it, we hired a, uh, a facilitator uh, from Maryland nonprofits that was helpful in terms of just getting the conversation going and collecting all our thoughts. Uh, so, that if, if you want to get that formal for something like that, uh, it wasn't that expensive. Okay. Just a suggestion. Was it three hours? It yeah, it was. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't very long. It was you know, one meal, and then you. You ate, so everybody had some food and then <laughs> and coffee, 
and uh, it went well. Yeah, it was very helpful. <laughs> So, so we are members of Maryland Nonprofit, and that is who's doing the board training that I sent the note about that's training, <laughs> governance-related training, not the same thing as what's being discussed. But they do, to Kevin's point, a variety of types of formats. Yeah, that, that, that'd be great. So if, if you can, uh, Kevin, if you can work with the lake and maybe uh, um, and, and out. Well, I'm asking, and, is that desired, or what? is it the more informal dinner? I guess I, I'm just saying, we can contact them, we have a membership, but is it the informal dinner? I think among us, we have the resources to self-facilitate this, mm -hmm. this puppy for three hours. I think we can handle it. Dick. We, we've, we've had board training again and again and again, and uh, everybody thinks it was wonderful, but then nothing changes. So I think this is something we really need to work on among ourselves. So a quick show of hands, who, who thinks that uh, ex external facilitator would be useful for the retreat? I th think we... Uh, for the retreat? For the retreat. Good. So it sounds like there's a, enough that uh, I think is worth looking into, at least for, uh, for the retreat. So you want Lakey to contact? Yes. All right. That's good. Just so just we know. Uh, any further questions? Well, any further topics, right? Any any gonna, further topics? New, yeah. Proposed new yeah, topics? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I sort of hesitate to recommend this, but I think uh, I would uh, suggest or request that we have a open space committee of some sort to get, get down, because although we're dealing with watershed and watershed's really important, open space as a whole is, and, and I think we really need to. Do this. We've seen the success of the Oakland Mills Open Space Board, and that. But we should emulate that, at least an ad hoc sort of group, of yeah. another small committee to, to get together. Thanks. Um, this is not exactly a topic, but uh, we have a Ukrainian refugee family in our village. Oh, yeah. The letter that just went out, I think the whole board saw yeah, it. Yeah, got that. Um, I was going to ask you, Lakey, if uh, we have our international uh, staff uh, I was hoping somebody could get in touch with them and see if we could get involved there. That's a great idea. Or membership staff, it seems to me. I, I finally remembered what I wanted to say, and this is sort of a new topic, but doesn't have to go much further. But when we were talking about the website and your goals and, and advocacy, uh, I haven't done it recently, but I, a few years ago I did a comparison one day of Reston's website and CA's website. And Reston's website, Reston Association, had so much in it about community involvement and how you could be a, an active citizen of, of Reston. And CA's read like, join, you know, join the gym. <laughs> and so my hope is that in our new uh, iteration of the website that we uh, include a lot more about community involvement and citizenship. Mm -hmm not yes. just this business side of CA. Branding. That, that is, well, already underway. Great. Yes, that is yeah, the great. plan. Thank Can you. I just add a little caveat to that? Because one of the things that came up at our village, and I think Jessica, my, pre my predecessor, was talking about, is a welcome center and or a museum and or an archives and a, a place, an actual exhibit center. center. So just something that, that where you, you, that people can learn about what Columbia's about. I suggested that do, years ago and got do, shot down, do, just do, for the record. Don't, oh. we have, don't we have an archives? That, <laughs> well, well, I tried to get it. We have an archives, but it's not no a place where there's like exhibits. For, you know, we used to have an exhibit center where you, you came to learn about <laughs> Columbia. I got you right. Right. So, a, 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 Any other me. actual new topics? Yeah, yeah. Jenny? Yeah, okay. Uh, two new topics. One, if we could get an update um, brief, like five minutes at uh, a meeting on the, uh, and the IIT members would, un would be able to explain this better, but I understand there's this area uh, in Symphony Woods that has a grass area that's uh, just been planted and it was funded by the county and it's not supposed to be driven on for one year, but apparently, allegedly, there was a violation of that and cars were driven on it. So I'd like to get an update as to one, what happened, uh, what's, and two, what's the role of CA 
Uh, that's issue one. Issue two is our um, encroachment policy that I believe <laughs> what I heard is CA have, has a new way of uh, establishing this by having a team member or team approach to encroachment. And uh, I'd like to really uh, understand better what we're doing and whether it's working or not. And I'd love to have you use the um, <laughs> Oakland Mills, Thunder Hill Road, in alleged encroachment uh, of the drain pipes going right into the stream of the two houses that I've been you know, expressing concerns about since August 2021. And also the most recent thing that I sent where allegedly one of the houses, the last house on Thunder Hill Road near 175 across from Walgreens is, has actually uh, cut down trees, expanded their property into CA property and is growing grass and uh, perhaps has their garden plot there too. So that would be a, a, an example of whether our encroachment policy is working or not, how effective is it, those two issues. Okay, thanks, any other new topics? Sherry? Um, yeah, I think, um, Lakey, you mentioned, um, and, I, and I think I read in this thing about the community development and real estate services, that this is a new, um, a new approach and we've, we've got some new hires. Um, some new personnel. And in the past, um, we've invited new staff members um, to come to the board for sort of a, a meet and greet, just a, a very brief kind of thing, so we can say hello, and welcome them to CA and find out, you know, a little bit about what they're doing and what they will be doing in the future. Um, so I was just thinking about that as something that maybe might be nice. Thanks. Any other new topics? That brings us to chair remarks. I'd like to thank uh, Dennis again for trying to organize the, uh, the the tour, and hopefully we'll get better weather next time. Um, Do we have a date now, or we're still working on a date? I, I think we're still working on a date, okay. but uh, Dennis, Dennis will email out uh, a new date, um, and I will also uh, email out to, about the uh, Lake Elkhorn uh, uh, subcommittee. Okay. Um, and we are. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Can I get a second? Any objections? Meeting is adjourned at uh, 1020.